All right, guys. Well, welcome. Oh, we got one more. <laughs> um, welcome to the workshop. Um, I'm Jesse, of course, and uh, really appreciate you all tuning in on a Sunday. I know your your brains are probably crammed full from, uh, you know, it being close to the end of the year. Um, so hopefully we won't uh, <laughs> overload them today. Uh, we will take breaks. We will uh, answer questions and we'll just try to have a lot of fun and keep it interactive and uh, hopefully you guys will walk away with a ton of like industry skills that will actually help you um, and you can put those to work starting today so with that I am gonna share my screen get my slides up here okay All right, cool. Yes, this is our class. Here we are. So, um, okay, another name for this is the secret sauce, right? So to me, color grading is like the, the not so secret last step to making something just totally pop, right? This is like color correction and color grading are the really the way to make your footage and your film stand out. When you see something that, you know, on, online or on the big screen that just looks amazing, you know, chances are it's gone through a color process. And, um, you know, I wrote, I wrote here, don't throw your money, don't throw away your money. And I, I can't tell you how many times I see people working with, you know, ex big expensive camera rigs, Aries and Reds and whatnot. And, um, and then, you know, maybe they're cutting in Premiere or something and then they just hit export and it's done. And, you know, again, to me, that's like throwing away your money, right? You spend all that money on your your beautiful camera and now you're not going to color grade the footage um what what a shame so let's not let that happen anymore <laughs> um so i kind of think of this as uh one half art and one half science okay so you know it's kind of a combination of like left brain and right brain i really want to get you guys thinking like a colorist in terms of like the image and what you're looking for and then how to accomplish it it's it's pretty surgical sometimes and pretty detailed but also it's just really artistic and it's a chance for you to kind of flex your creative skills. Um, if any of you have done photo editing like in Lightroom or Photoshop before, you're gonna see a lot of the same skills used today. So it's really transferable. Um, yeah. So I'm teaching this um, because again, like I said before, Resolve is, is totally industry standard. It's really powerful. It's probably the best color correction tool out there. Um, and it really speaks for itself. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time advertising it because y'all are already here. <laughs> um, me personally, um, I am a UCSC film and digital media alum. Um, that was just about 10 years ago that I graduated. So since then I've been working in the industry. I've worked in uh, commercials, music videos, um, nonprofit work, you know, narrative films, documentary films. And I've been a part of um, about six or seven features at this point. Um, one of which I, I co-directed. So the main thing here is just to get you guys thinking like a colorist, and have a ton of fun. And I really promise you that this will help every other aspect of your filmmaking, even, even writing and editing and everything. It'll kind of help you out with um, preparing for that final stage, which is the color grade. So really quick, let me just go back to this here. Or you know what? No, let's go ahead. Okay, so we're going to cover um, just kind of, you know, six categories here. And then the last things are just kind of exercises and, and some question time. We will stop for questions at the end of every section. So, you know, the first thing's program setup, right? How to get your settings ready, you know, kind of dial it in, just the basic stuff you need to get Resolve working on your computer. Then we have, you know, getting your edit into the timeline, right? So this is not an editing course. We are not teaching everyone how to be an all-star editor. You know, we're assuming that you've got some editing experience under your belt. You're, you know, you're probably in the film program, so you guys know what you're doing there. Um, that would be a whole different class. So <laughs> we're not going to do a ton of editing today. We are going to work with the timeline in, in DaVinci, which has everything and more that, that the Premiere and Final Cut timeline features have. So, so we get the edit into the timeline. Once you're in the program, in the timeline, then we're going to learn how to read video scopes and start kind of correcting um, and doing balancing which is also known as primary color correction. And then we're gonna move into the world of uh, what's called secondaries, which is also called secondary color correction. And that is sort of like 
sculpting the look and building the image a little further. So think of primaries and um, color correction as sort of like just getting it to look realistic and look like it's in the real world. And then secondaries are kind of, you know, building individual features into the image, like, you know, maybe the yellows look really gold and the shadows look really, you know, blue and cold and dark or something like those are secondary adjustments that don't happen on the whole image. They just happen on a part of it. So um, the next part of this is going to be looks and finishing, which is sort of, you know, once you're kind of building secondaries into your image, you're kind of coming up on a creative look, right? You're, you're sort of like generating um, kind of a stylized image. And then finishing is, you know, anything we're going to do on the last part of the image, which is like adding film grain, sharpening, um, you know, lifting up the black levels on all the footage to make it look kind of, kind of milky and kind of cool. Um, next, we'll do export and delivery, which is totally a breeze and it's its own screen in, in, uh, in DaVinci Resolve. We'll talk about some exercises to try and then we'll have some extra time even more at the end for any last questions that come up um, to review. And I don't know if you guys caught this earlier, but I'm also gonna make the footage set available that we're gonna work with at first. We're gonna work with two, uh, two sets of footage. The first one today is gonna be sort of a fake wine commercial that I created just for the purposes of this class. Um, this is like, you know, a piece of spec work um, I just kind of made. It kind of emulates a situation, you know, you might encounter where you either go out and shoot a, shoot a commercial for someone and then you have to color grade it or someone else's work that you then are just the colorist on. So that's what we're gonna do. What we're not gonna do today, we are, again, we are not gonna teach editing. Y'all know how editing works. Um, we are gonna go a little bit over the timeline controls, um, but not, not learning editing today. Uh, we're not doing any compositing or special effects. We're not doing any audio mixing. This is totally a visual class, um, just visual in the sense that we're just color correcting. Um, we're not gonna talk fancy camera stuff. We're not gonna talk camera settings, although, there's a couple of things to know about, you know, how to set up uh, log modes and things like that, which is kind of like how you how you prime the camera to to create the best type of footage to to then color correct. So we'll we'll touch on that, but we're not going to really talk in depth about what are the best camera settings and yada yada. So, and then of course uh, we will not cover how to be a total Instagram star. But if you use this stuff today, if you use color correction and you start grading your stuff instead of using the Instagram filters then uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'll all become Instagram stars. So anyway, so why, why do we do this? Why do we bother with color correction? Why can't we just do this in, you know, kind of adjust a couple of things in Premiere and just call it a day? Well, the, the first thing is that we need, oh, sorry guys, my dog is actually acting up one second. I'm gonna go pull her in here. Oh, wow, I think it's the mailman. Just a sec here. Well, while Jesse's uh, gone for a second, if you guys have any questions, by the way, um, there will be uh, breaks uh, throughout this uh, this workshop uh, for you guys to ask your questions. So um, ju just save those for, for when we have those allotted breaks because that, that's the time for you to ask questions. Um, and when you do ask questions, just leave them in the chat um, so we can go through them one by one in an orderly fashion. The joys of working from home. Yeah, dog, my dog feels uh, sad that she's not going to learn color color correction. <laughs> All right, so so why do we do this? So the first thing is to get the full dynamic range out of your footage. You know, if you shoot it in a regular color mode and let the ca camera decide on your color settings, you are basically going to you're going to be stuck with that. You know, you're going to be stuck with whatever the camera decides, and you're not going to get a ton of control over the final color. You know, sure you can kind of like wing it and hope that it ends up nice but this is about giving you the most control possible um, on the top left here we've got this sort of natural uh, stop range here and a log stop range so again if you are shooting in like a rec 709 look which is basically like standard contrast in the camera you'll be limited probably in your brightness and how how bright and how dark the footage can be if you're shooting in a log mode which we'll get into later you know, again, you're adding 
uh, you're adding gradation, you're adding kind of to the maximum bright and maximum dark that the camera can produce. So really pulling all that dynamic range out, like this still here from moonlight, uh, you can see that, you know, you got clouds, everything is in exposure properly. You got shadows, midtones, highlights, everything's working, working properly. So anyway, um, you know, we color because we want the emotion and the feel, you know, this is like the mood of the piece. Um, the movie Her on the bottom left here, like you can see this kind of pastel, pastel feeling, you know, every color decision makes an emotional impact. And so this kind of soft pastel feel is kind of like, you know, his inner world and his like, his emotional uh, state and everything It kind of guides the film. So um, another reason we do color correction is for translation and playability, right? So we might color correct something and then it might look totally different on another monitor. So correcting and grading is kind of get everything in kind of the central range where, you know, it's gonna play back properly. It's gonna actually look how you intend it to on other screens, on iPhone, and in a theater. So there's a little bit of a difference between grading and correction. And like I said um, in the previous slide, correction is getting the image into like a basic balanced state. You know, the whites look white, the blacks look black, the colors are saturated and regular and everything looks like real life. And then grading is taking that a step further and sort of stylizing it, you know, like bottom left, this does not look like how our eyes see or real life, this is like a stylization. But once you kind of get in front of that image, it does something to your brain and tells you the emotion of the scene. So again, the big thing here, mood. This is why we are color grading. We are creating the mood. We are creating an atmosphere. We are creating a scene and uh, pulling the viewer in. Okay, things you're gonna need. Resolve, uh, today we're working with 17, but it doesn't really matter if you're working with 15 or 16. The features are largely the same and everything will translate to today's lesson. And like I mentioned in the studio version, which is 300 bucks, you're gonna get some extra features. You're gonna get denoising, you're gonna get some beauty looks, um, controls and things like that. And then you're also gonna get the ability to work in stereoscopic, which is like 3D. Um, I don't do that, but um, a lot of folks do. You will also need, of course, a workstation with a GPU. Um, the GPU is pretty much the most important part of this thing because that is what DaVinci leans on when it is working. It really uses the GPU to color correct and to decode footage, which means read the codec and make pixels on the screen. Um, a calibrated monitor, very helpful. You know, if you're able to work on a Mac screen, you are already setting yourself up for, for success because Mac monitors are fantastic. They really do have a lot of realistic dynamic range and they just reproduce color pretty well out of the box. So if you're using a Mac, you probably don't need a calibrated monitor. If you are working on a PC like I am, you're probably gonna wanna buy a calibrated monitor. Um, and you know, that, that comes in various flavors, but I like to, I use a BenQ 4K one that's got a lot of, um, you know, it's a 10 bit monitor, which is important, not eight bit. And it really helps display and give me an idea of the realistic calibrated color. Last thing here is uh, solid state discs, you know, SSDs are really fast. And when you're working with color, uh, you wanna be able to pull footage off the hard drive quickly. And then the GPU is kind of like working on that footage to show you the correction in real time. So combination of having a, you know, uh, graphic processing card and then an SSD, that's kind of the, the sweet sauce there. So, okay, so here we go. Um, I guess it's time to start the program now. So I'm gonna open up DaVinci. And so while this starts up here, let's see if there's anything else I need to cover. So, all right. Yeah, one, one thing I will say while this is starting up is, um, you know, you guys can totally follow along, you know, if you have DaVinci open on your computer and you wanna mess around as we go, that's totally fine. Um, I will make the footage set available after the class or, you know, kind of at the end of the class. Um, but, you know, I would kind of encourage you just to like kind of chill and just watch and, and kind of absorb everything so that you see it all and you don't miss everything or miss anything. Um, but again, go bananas, you know, if you wanna dial up uh, DaVinci right now and just start going for it, then I, you know, I'm not gonna stop you, so. 
All right, pretty hefty program. Takes a little while to load here. So Resolve is you know, essentially like six programs in one. Like I was saying before, it's like an editing program. It's a color correction program. You can mix your sound. You can do um, what are called fusion effects. And fusion is sort of like after effects, which is built in to Resolve. Um, what they did a couple of years ago is they bought up a bunch of other programs that were really good. They just bought them out and kind of stuck them into the program. Um, you know, sort of the same way that like Premiere purchased the Lumetri software and stuck that in as their color correction module. DaVinci's just been, or, you know, Blackmagic Design has been buying up other softwares and integrating them, which is pretty fun. So you get a lot of functionality for not a lot of cost. Oops, here. All right, so when you fire up DaVinci, you're going to hit this home screen, okay? And, you know, mine looks like this because I've done a bunch of projects in here. The main thing we need to think about when we're when we're loading up DaVinci is, you know, it does not work in the same way that Premiere does where you have project files, okay? This is super important. DaVinci actually has a database on the hard drive of your workstation, of your computer. When you install Resolve, it's gonna put that database probably in your documents folder. Um, that's fine, but you know, it's really nice to be able to take that database file and back it up and, and put it places, especially if you wanna transfer it you know, or give it to someone else to finish a project, you know, to keep it portable. You can do an export of a project and kind of do like a project package, which is a DRP file. I'll show us how to do that once we're in a project. But the main thing you need to know right now is that, you know, again, it works in databases. So you just want to put your database somewhere that it's not going to get modified or moved or you know, it's not gonna disappear, right? So like Dropbox is probably kind of an unsafe place because it could be messed with or it could change, you know, but I definitely would encourage backing up your, your database when you can. So what you do is you come down here, the bottom left, and you hit new database. This may be hidden by default. So you gotta click this little side view right here. See that? And then you go down to new database. At this point, you will set the name, you know, you can call it resolve 17 DB or whatever you want, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then, you know, browse, probably not desktop, that's probably not a great spot for it, but you know, so I can put it on this drive right here and save it somewhere that again, it's not gonna get messed with. Okay, so I've already got one created, um, so I'm not gonna do that, but that is how you could create a database or you can just use the built-in one that DaVinci has here. And that single database has all of your, pro it's got all of your projects, it's got everything. So, you know, just, just keep that in mind. It's kind of like all there in one spot. So <laughs> all your eggs in one basket. So you create that and then you get a nice blank project here, which is this, right? So I am gonna just double click on untitled project and that's gonna take us right in to a blank project. Okay. Now we're in the program. So on the bottom here, you can see all these different little logos, these little, little pages here. So there's media, which is like your project bins in Premiere, right? You've got your, um, above this middle line here, you've got everything on your system. You've got all your hard drives and then the list of files there. Below this middle line, you have your projects. So this is everything in your actual project that's been pulled in. On the left are bins. And your master bin never goes away. It's never deleted. So if something's missing, you can't find it in a, in a bin, click up to master because it's probably there. So right clicking lets you do a new bin. And I'm gonna make a bin called media. You know, I, if I was doing a big project with every all the different assets, I'd probably have like, you know, audio and media and I'd make a folder for exports, you know, subtitles, whatever, all the different things that you would normally have. Um, but staying organized is gonna help you uh, blast through a project, you know, don't, don't just chuck everything into master and kind of hope for the best. You want to name stuff, you know, you're going to have to come back to projects later that you worked on months ago and you want to be able to read, read what your work is and just kind of know how to work with it. I have a couple films right now that someone just asked me if I could go back and change uh, some of the credits or add a couple names to the credits, you know, so I had to fire it back up again and kind of open it and see like, okay, where are my credits and, you know, do all that. So that helps. Um, so the main thing, um, the main thing is, you know, you're going to pull stuff from this top area into your bottom area here, right? 
So I'm gonna navigate to my media folder. And before I go any further, I just wanna kind of overview these other pages, right? So media is where you deal with media. You can do um, metadata over here. You can, you can do all kinds of logging and stuff. But basically this is where you're importing and organizing stuff, okay? Um, the cut page here, this is kind of like a hyper editor. This is like for doing dailies and like quick assemblies. I don't ever use cut and we're not gonna discuss it today because we're not talking about editing, but there's plenty of great YouTube tutorials on you know, how the cut page can kind of speed up your workflow or if you're an assistant editor, how you can kind of like prep stuff for the edit window here. Once I click over to edit page, now we've got our editor, right? Here's a timeline, here's a viewer. Um, this all looks pretty familiar, right? So we've got um, this, this little logo up in the top right, toggles your dual screen where you've got your source and your program. Final Cut or Premiere editors, you're probably pretty used to seeing that. So um, that's the edit page. Fusion, I'm not even gonna touch because again, that's like special effects land. We're not going there. Color, we're gonna live here today. We're gonna be very much in the color, <laughs> color zone. Um, Fairlight is that audio uh, portion that I mentioned where you can do your audio mix in here. Again, very powerful, very useful. And Deliver, which is your export section. It's got your file name, it's got your presets, it's got, you know, do you wanna export for Vimeo, YouTube, um, all these sorts of things. And then you've got your audio and video settings, kind of like Media Encoder or Premiere, uh, resolution, you know, frame rate, all that stuff. So, you know, you, you get something finished up in color and then you go to deliver and then you, you know, dial in your settings here, give it a name, you hit add to render queue, it pops into here and you hit render and that is the end of your workflow. So. Resolve has kind of built this to go left to right. You know, you start with media, you pull things in, you cut it up, you get the edit refined. Maybe you do some special effects. Then you got your color, audio, and it's out. So um, some basic stuff real quick to set up with the program. So we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna blast through this real quick. So your program preferences are up here in the DaVinci Resolve menu at the top left. DaVinci Resolve preferences. And so, we already did the database screen, that's all done. Um, and it's kind of set up by default. This is the actual program preps. These do not change uh, project to project, okay? So the big stuff here um, really is just, um, let's see here, project save and load. So what you wanna do is you wanna go to your user panel here, not system, but user. That's gonna make sure that every time you fire it up, it's listening to your settings. Uh, so and again, uh, you know, DaVinci Resolve, just to get you back here, DaVinci Resolve preferences, user, project save and load. I really like to click this live save button here. Um, this is not checked by default for some reason, which kind of baffles me, but live save, you know, is what it sounds like. It's basically like anything you do is automatically saved. Um, and then you can also check project backups too. This is much more like an auto save type thing. Uh, Resolve used to have auto save set to like 25 minutes or something, which, you know, if you're working, if you're slaying through a timeline and trying to color correct, that's like years of work. You know, it's like <laughs> if something crashes, that's a big loss. 25 minutes, a lot could happen in 25 minutes. So, you know, live save and project backups. And again, you could shift this down to five minutes, you know, or whatever. Um, this kind of helps you just leave breadcrumbs, make sure you're not going to lose your work. Project backup location, this is nice because you can put this somewhere like, you know, you could put this on Dropbox and then it would save automatically and back up to the cloud. So that is the main setting I want you guys to know about in the actual program, okay? Again, resolve menu, preferences, that's that. Project settings, and this is a little tricky. Um, project settings are down here in the gear icon on the bottom right. I know this kind of looks like the program settings, but it's not. This is for your actual project, okay? So you click that, you get in here. And the biggest thing here is master settings on the left, okay? We're not gonna go through all the menus and all the settings, but just the big stuff here. Timeline resolution, you know, I know most of us are probably shooting and working in 4K these days. Doesn't matter if you're working in 4K, 8K, whatever. Put your timeline in HD, okay? 
this is something that will save you a ton of headache. You just want to work in HD. You don't need to be seeing everything in 4K. Um, things will play a lot better. You know, if you're working in 4K, the computer is literally working four times as hard to create an image for you. So just just save yourself the hassle. You know, if you have like a really burly computer that can handle it, you know, give it a give it a try. But when I have to deliver in 4K, what I do is I work in HD, and then right before I'm done. I come back here and I go, okay, actually, I would like to do 4K Ultra HD. And everything in your timeline will, uh, will be set. It will, it will change it, it will do it, it will totally, it'll just work. The one thing you really need to set here that can't be changed is your frame rate. Uh, DaVinci sets up the frame rate engine in a certain way that you can't really mess with it as soon as a piece of media or a timeline is in the program. So I'm gonna do, um, film frame here. I'm going to go back to my HD. And for some reason, this doesn't want to let me. Oh, huh, this is weird. Oh, format. I see. Yeah. yeah, sometimes if this gets set weird, you can just go to video format and NTSC should give you what you need. Oh, hold on. I lied. <laughs> just a second. I'm going to choose uh, all right, HD 24p here. Still not giving me that for some reason. That's pretty weird. Um, sorry, guys, just a minute. Oh, okay, I, <laughs> I brought it back. So again, it should be kind of default in HD. Um, and then down here, the one that I ended up picking was HD 1080p SF24. Uh, that's what it likes to use. And then I'm gonna change this from 24 to 23.976. 24 is actually not a real frame rate for digital video. If you're on a computer, doing 24p, it's really 23.976. The only time you'd want 24 is if you were actually exporting to real film. Like if you were gonna finish this on a computer and then print to real film stock, we're not doing that today. So 23.976, playback, same thing, great. Next thing down, image scaling. That was master settings, this is right below it, image scaling. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing here is this input scaling, right? So if you have a file or a clip that's not the size of your timeline, you want to fill the frame with it, right? Without having to scale or, or you know, set that up. Like it's gonna do it for you. So the setting here is scale full frame with crop. You don't wanna stretch because that's gonna distort your image. You know, it's gonna scale it in a horizontal or vertical dimension, not great. You wanna do full scale. So again, Scale full frame with crop is gonna make sure that everything fills the frame when it comes in. Okay, last thing here is color management. Again, just the going one, two, three, right down these, color management. And all you gotta do down here is go and check this make broadcast safe checkbox. This is a safety net for you. So it's gonna make sure that, you know, you don't have any like super white whites that can't be uh, expressed in the video codec or the signal. Um, like basically the total dynamic range of the video will be within broadcast limits. So if this ever has to go on television or to big screen, it's gonna kind of just clip off everything and roll off the highlights and roll off the shadows at the right spot. Very helpful. Change project frame rate, yes, that's fine. Okay, so that's the boring stuff, guys. Now we're gonna actually start work. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull in a clip and what I want to what I want to talk about here is that there are basically three ways to work in, in a timeline okay so what you can do I'm going to load up a different project so the first way is is kind of the the native uh, the native workflow which and by native I mean you know you're doing everything natively in resolve you are fully you know you're, you're creating an edit here's our timeline I've cut the footage up you know, and I've, I've created it here. I've made this all just like in the, in the timeline in Premiere. And once I'm done with the edit page, then I can go over to color and do it that way, right? That is the native workflow. And that's totally possible for any project you create in DaVinci exclusively and export out of there. The next thing you can do, of course, is you edit somewhere else, like you edit in Premiere, and then you pull this in. And, you know, that's, that's probably, um, you're probably gonna accomplish that by um, 
collecting your project files in a folder, exporting an XML, and then doing an import here. So file import media from XML. And that is basically going to bring in your timeline. It's gonna bring in your media and um, recreate your whole timeline here in, in Premiere. Now, the one thing, the caveat with that is that you're not gonna have your Premiere effects, right? So you're not gonna have warp stabilizer. You're not gonna have Lumetri color. You're probably not gonna have all your like opacity keyframes and anything you've done with that. So, you know, you kind of wanna make a note in, in your edit, you maybe write it down in your notes or something that, you know, hey, clips, clips nine and 20 need um, stabilization, you know, clip, clip 12 needs denoising or whatever. So you kind of do have to recreate some of the stuff you've done if you're bringing it all over from Premiere. The good news is that, you know, DaVinci can do all that stuff, right? And it usually does it better than Premiere. The stabilizer, it's got a great stabilizer and um, et cetera. So, just be aware you're not gonna get every feature necessarily, but you will get your original raw clips. And this is the best way to work, right? The native workflow or the imported workflow, you're gonna get the full resolution out of your files because these are the original camera files that were shot with. And just, just for your information, you know, working with original camera footage files is the highest quality way to work. You know, DaVinci basically reads that original camera footage. It's applying your color settings and then it exports it on the deliver screen. So it's like one level of processing and it's out. You're not like reconverting and reconverting and reconverting and transcoding, which can kind of mess up your footage. The third and final way to do this is what's called um, sort of an intermediate format, right? Like you might export this to uh, ProRes and then uh, pull this all together from there. So. I'm gonna go back to my untitled. And that's how we're gonna to work today because it's the easiest. And honestly, you know, if you just export a ProRes cut of all your shots back to back from Premiere with all the effects taken off, that's probably the easiest and quickest way. You know, yes, you are doing one intermediate conversion of media, like you're gonna process it, you know, into ProRes, and then you're gonna export that one more time in the deliver screen. So it's like the second highest way to work, not totally ideal, um, but it is really fast. And most stuff, if you're just going to the internet with it, you know, it's like totally fine. So here's how we do that. Let's do it. I'm gonna go to my drive uh, here where I've got my wine commercial. I'm gonna go to this file, this MXF. This is the, the ProRes export, okay? So I've got all my color turned off. You can see it looks very flat. Everything looks really, you know, like it was shot in log, very low contrast. And there you go, very flat. We're gonna color correct this. You always wanna start with the log footage. And by log, I mean, you know, the widest dynamic range color setting you can do on the camera. If you're shooting Canon, it's C log. If you're shooting oh, the drone, a DJI drone, it's gonna be D log. You know, there's different names for the different log settings, but that's kind of what you want. So this was shot with a Mavic. The aerials were shot with a Mavic 2, so D-Log setting for that. And the on-ground stuff was shot on a A7. Um, again, I'm not using a fancy camera here, guys. It's just a DSLR, but I do have it set to S-Log, which is Sony's log uh, codec. Uh, and actually, actually color space, not codec, sorry. So. All right, I've got this file. I exported it from Premiere. I'm ready to start coloring. So I'm gonna click this here, right click it. And I'm gonna say scene cut detection. So, you know, I can pull this in this way and I can like, you know, I can right click and I can say, okay, let's make a new timeline. Great, call it timeline one, don't really care. Load that up. Okay, and here's, here's the whole timeline, right? There's my music, there's my, my video but I don't really have my clips, right? Like this isn't really set up for color grading because these aren't clipped out yet. So I could go through here, you know, and I could, I go frame by frame, left, left. And just so you guys know, I, I have a keyboard logger in my bottom left screen here. So you should be able to see kind of what keys I'm hitting. And hopefully that'll help you in the replay if you watch that as well. So I could go in here, you know, I could go frame by frame as soon as I get to the next clip. Okay, great. I'm gonna click on my razor 
my blade and cut. And then I can go to the next clip, find that and cut. You know, I'm slicing my audio here. Like I don't need to be doing that. And also this could be tedious, right? Like what if you're working on an hour long movie like this, you can't just go in here and have to razor every shot. That's gonna take you an afternoon. So control Z, control Z, which is undo of course. And I'm gonna do this automatically. The selector in the timeline is just the A key. So that gets you back to arrow, A for arrow. And then, you know, you can grab and move this around. The blade is B. So really just A and B, I'm going back and forth. These right here are sort of like for slipping and trimming stuff. That's, that's advanced editing. We're not gonna do that today. So just gonna go back to my media pool, which is again on the media page. Right clicking on the wine spec. Uh, the MXF is like a pro, it's not ProRes, it's actually DNX HD, which is just like ProRes. And I'm gonna say scene cut detection. And actually, you know, to do that, I'm gonna do split and add in. You know what? No, this is the way to do it. We'll do scene cut detection. So now we got the scene detection window. This is like a special window that just does this one thing. This helps you clip out your clips from an individual from a whole uh, export one clip file. So, you know, again, if I scrub through here, I can see that the film's playing. What are these three windows? Okay, so the first window, really all three of these are just like film strip, right? So if I actually just kind of hit the arrow and go through, you can see that these are all just playing, but they're not identical. Okay, these are three frames in a row. These are the three frames in a row. So as I go arrow, arrow, arrow over, I can see, okay, well, right here is the, that's the previous shot and here's the next shot, right? What I'm looking for is I want the next, I want the next one to be in the middle here. So current frame is in the middle, previous frames on the left, next frames on the right. I want the current frame to be the next new one of the new clip. So again, I can go through here and I can say add, which will add a cut. You can see that here by the green line. But again, that is just as slow as the last way I did it. So I will delete that, go back, and I will say auto scene detect. And it's done. Look at that. Da Vinci's amazing. Uh, just because the computer decided that these are correct doesn't mean it is. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to click this, click through this list. I can also hit down arrow, but what I'm looking for again is like for the first frame of the next clip to be in the middle frame here. Okay, so I'm going down this list. Yep, looks good. So I want to see one and then a double of that next one. Good, good, great, perfect. Yes, 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 done. And that's the last clip. Okay, right on. So it did it correctly. If it doesn't do it correctly, you know, you can take this pink bar and you can raise it up above. And the length of the green line is basically telling you how confident Resolve is in detecting that clip, right? So if it's like way down here, it's like, I'm not really sure, you know, make sure this pink bar is above it so it doesn't activate it. If these two were not real ones, if they were fake, they were detected, but they're incorrect, just move the bar above that. And you can see that the edit list decreases here. We don't want that because it is correct. So we're going to leave it. And one more thing about kind of making a ProRes export or an intermediate export to then chop up and color in DaVinci is you don't want any effects or fades on the footage, right? This just starts like full frame, no cross dissolve. If, if you add a cross dissolve or a fade in on this and then export it, you know, when you color that clip, it's going to do strange stuff because you're kind of like acting on a clip that's already been faded down into the dark and your, your lights and shadows aren't gonna look correct. So again, totally naked. This is just a, a collection of clips. Boom, 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 all slammed together, all exported in one chunk. Okay, so I got all the chunks, boom, 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 eight shots. Now I'm gonna go down here. I don't need to select any of these. I'm just gonna hit add cuts to media pool. Okay, this will not go away. It will confuse you, but it did do it. And we close that. Okay, now I've got these folders I made. I made these bins, you know, so media, this is media. Instead of now having this one wine spec MXF, I've got like eight 
right? Because it made eight or nine clips. I'm gonna drag those into media. And now you're like, well, okay, but what order are the shots in now? Do I have to like re-edit the whole thing? Like, that's annoying. No, you don't. Um, if these get messed up or out of order, you can just go right here to this start TC column, which is start time code. And you'll see that, you know, okay, this first one starts on zero, second shot comes in at two seconds, five seconds, seven, 10, 12, and so on. So you can be sure that you're sorting the correct way. If you sort top to bottom, you'll know that this will always be in the correct order. And how to make it into your timeline really easily is just to kind of do a list select, right click, and do a good old top of the menu, create new timeline using selected clips. Okay, it's gonna want us to, to name it now. I'm gonna call it wine commercial. And now it stuck it in this folder. Well, that's annoying, right? Let's organize, new bin, timelines. Where's my stuff? Well, it's in media. I'm gonna drag and drop wine commercial over to timelines. Note the icon difference guys, like check this out. This looks like footage, right? It's like a little footage frame. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully you can see this on the, uh, the live stream. It will be more clear in the replay if you check it out too, but this little like collection of clips, boop, 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 right here, that's a timeline. Clip, timeline, and the timeline has no file format, right? It's just whatever you call it. And if you click into it again, you can just rename it, modify it. You can do a right click and say duplicate. You know, this is all like Premiere stuff. It's basically the same here. So I won't waste too much time um, with the media bin. Okay, dragging the wine commercial timeline into the timeline bin, drop it. And now here I am. So I can double click on that. And lo and behold, we have loaded up in our edit screen. How cool is this? Okay, I'm gonna go back to my arrow, which is A. And I'll check it. Yep, looks good. These are all new shots, doop, 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 do. Going on through, cool. And there's the product shot at the end. I'm gonna quickly play a finished version of this for you guys. So you can just see kind of what we're gonna end up with today. Um, and I'm gonna do that in VLC. Hopefully this plays correctly. Um, there's also some titles in here I made. We're not gonna do that today, but just to kind of give you an idea of how the finished ones would look, here we go. Super cheesy, super basic. That's what we're gonna make today. Okay, so now, Um, also, guys, feel free to type questions into the chat box as um, as we go here, and then we will get to them after each kind of or at each break section. That way, you don't forget what you want to ask. All right, nothing, huh? Okay, great. Well, that is all sweet. All right, so now we're going to go into color correction. So we got the timeline here; it's loaded up. All looks good, and now we just click the color, and here we are. Okay. So what is going on here? So we've got, we've got a lot of stuff cooking here. Okay, so you know, real quick, um, on the left side, of course, we have the viewer. This never goes away. You can't turn this off. This is just like, you know, your program viewer. The color controls in the bottom also cannot be turned off, although you can um, 
you know, you can kind of mess with a few things here. Essentially, you know, it doesn't go away. This kind of bottom just stays here. And all these tools, all these color tools are what change the menus on the bottom here, depending on what's up. Your scopes will stay on the right here. Um, you can show and hide your clip roll. This is really useful. Um, this will show you kind of a live reading of everything in its current state. So it's really great for comparing shots. You can see like what needs work, what doesn't need work. As soon as you modify something, like if I just start to modify this, this will light up. You see how this number three has got a color, a rainbow thing around it. That means, hey, this has had color done to it of some sort. You don't know what you've done. You just know that something's happened. If I hit control Z, that turns off because then it's back to its original state. So again, clips in the top, top right, you can turn that on and off. Uh, timeline, you know, again, same thing. You can turn on your timeline here. I, I don't really see a use for this because you know, you are you were just in your timeline, right? You know what your edit is. You just know you need your shots now. So I usually keep that off and just go to clips. This is what I'm turning on and off constantly because I want to get through. I want to go to this one now and check this one. Okay, great. Once I'm there, I like to get my room. I like to make some room for everything. And that last one I just shut off was nodes. So nodes are sort of this. Let's talk about nodes real quick. So nodes are how DaVinci handles color. Um, these are processing steps. So this is like a first step of processing. Um, to add another node, I hit Alt S on the keyboard and it adds a secondary one. I can keep going and adding stuff. The idea here is that you can kind of set up your color workflow the way you want it. And then you can click the number and you can shut off individual things, right? So you get your balance, you color correct, da, 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 you get something looking nice. And now you want to denoise it. Well, you want to do that on a, on a later node, right? So having this ability to, to kind of check things on and off is really useful. And I can de decide if, you know, what I'm doing on node four actually made it better or, or made it worse. You always want to be checking against, you know, an original clip to be like, okay, did I even make this better, right? <laughs> You could get totally inspired and go off the creative deep end, end up with something really weird, you know? So you kind of want to always be checking, like, did I make this better or not? <laughs> um, and sometimes it's, it's kind of painful to see, you know, like when you come back to a, a color correct that you did, you're like, wow, I, I did that? That's, <laughs> that's unique. <laughs> so anyway, that's nodes. They process, you know, in order left to right. Um, there's a little more we can do with that, but essentially we're going to stay on just kind of a linear node structure today. You know, you can do, um, you can do layers, you know, you can, you can basically break stuff out and have these both get processed at the same time and then get mixed here. Again, this is more advanced. Um, there's plenty of great YouTube tutorials on why you want to do this, but we're trying to just get you guys to be like color, color correction champs, you know, with, with just the basic stuff here. So. Um, let's delete that and that, and then I can rehook this up to the end. Great. Make sure this green one's hooked up to the end. If it's not, you won't get any signal. I can modify this all day. Changes on the node, but what's it going to? Nothing. So just make sure that's all set. Hook it up. Boom. Let's not think about nodes for a bit because that's kind of crazy. All right. So I will say, you know, when you're trying to do a color correction project, if you're working for someone else, you know, people have expectations, right? People go, oh, I want, you know, I want the look of the, of, um, you know, that movie Gladiator, or I want it to look like a horror movie. I want it to look like The Ring or, you know, something like weird like that, where everything's green and cold and creepy and, you know, and that's all, that's all gravy, except the footage, you know, like how it's shot is everything. Okay. So you can't just turn something into something else automatically. You really need to shoot it for that. And that's where lighting comes in, you know, how it's lit, how it's exposed, all that stuff really matters. So you want to shoot for the color, correct? You know, you want to shoot it like you want it to look. So that way the colorist just has to enhance it a little bit. Um, you know, your first job as a colorist is really not to to make it worse. Like I was saying, you know, in that past thing with nodes, it's like, did I make it better? Or did I make it worse? Well, yeah, you don't, you want to protect the decisions that the director and the DP have already made, right? They spent a lot of time working on lighting, working on looks, getting the fashion correct, you know, styling, everything, hair, makeup. You're not here to like reinvent all that for them and tell them how to do their job, right? They already did it. You're here to make them look good. So you're here to make that already, that those decisions that they already made just 
kind of pop more, if that makes sense. So, great, okay, let's see here. So I think we're gonna go into, we're just gonna start here with this first shot. And we are gonna do, um, we're gonna do scopes. So this is, this is where we kind of talk about the art and the science of everything, right? This is like, you know, the scopes are your science part. And then the art kind of happens over here on the left with your controls and kind of like dialing everything in, you know? So, you know, there's a lot of tools here, but we're gonna get through them, don't worry. So the main place you are gonna hang out when you are coloring is color wheels. Um, these are like camera settings and color matching stuff, which is not really used except for advanced um, applications. So really color wheels is where you wanna hang out. This, net, this one next to it, which is HDR, that's if you shot like true HDR footage, which is a whole nother ball game. Stay away from that for now. It's not really gonna help us learn anything. Um, so we got color, color primaries here, um, which are divided up into these three little, three little sections, okay? So anytime you see dots, that's gonna correspond to these menus on the right side here. So wheels, bars, and log. Wheels, bars, and log. So we're gonna stay in primaries on wheels, okay? And the scope I'm gonna start with is waveform. So this is not a histogram, guys. What this is, is this is a, um, it's a luminance graph. Zero is black, true black, and 1023, there's a, you know, 1,024 steps here. 1023 is true white. So oftentimes you will actually be surprised if you read scopes on a movie that's finished or something, you're actually not gonna be hitting black. You're not gonna be clipping it off at black and you're not gonna be clipping it off at white. You're gonna be kind of like in this middle zone here, you know, and you don't really wanna, you don't really wanna, you know, smack this up against true white because you're, you're getting blowout, right? Like clipping, highlight clipping. I mean, that's not, always gonna be the rule, right? Sometimes you need a window to be super blown out and look really bright. And that can be okay for little little spots, you know, if you have like a specular highlight on like a car or something. Yeah, that can be pure white, that's okay. But you know, you wanna save those bright, bright, bright pixels for when it really matters, right? The way I think of it is kind of like, you know, if you're in the movie theater, the movie, unless you're watching like Dunkirk or something where the mix was super loud, you know, the movie is staying at a pretty medium volume the whole time. The only time that Dolby system is going to really kick in and really fire at, you know, <laughs> maximum power is when you have a momentary event, like a gunshot or like a, a car door slamming or someone yelling or like, you know, a dramatic moment. You want to save that stuff. You want to save, you know, those sound moments for when it's important and not be blasting people the whole time. So in the same way, you want to do that with your color space. You don't want to be you know, slamming this up here and saying, yeah, cool, bright, all right. You know, you wanna be conservative. You wanna be like, you can see how this red's almost hitting the, the clipping point. So, you know, as you go over, it's not always apparent, but you're starting to lose information here and you don't really want that. Okay, so like I said, how it's shot really is everything. You wanna honor the decisions already made on set and not try to kind of reinvent the wheel, just sort of improve what's already there. So again, this scope is showing me Here's dark, here's white. And a histogram, which you're probably you know, used to, puts dark on the left and bright on the right, but this is doing it vertically. And this is actually showing me horizontally the kind of information. So if I look at this kind of these mid-tones that are scattered over here, kind of mid to dark tones, that's this like tree right here. So this actually, this part of the image corresponds with this vertical strip right here, right? The right side vertical is like this line of pixels on the right. And this left side is like all the pixels on the left. So you can kind of like trace through and find stuff, you know, like, so if you, if you scrub through, you can see like, this is actually panning left to right because the shot is panning, which is kind of weird to understand at first, but you'll, you'll get the hang of it. So if you ever see like a highlight and you're not sure like where it's coming from, you can come in here and be like, okay, about 80% over to the right of the frame which is like here, something's happening and I need to be aware of it. So this just helps you kind of locate brightness on a scale of like the left to right of the whole frame, right? This is the whole frame spread out left to right. Kind of a weird way to work, but starts to get really useful. Okay, so the three main primary controls here are lift, gamma and gain. 
Okay, and again, we're going for balancing here. This is not color grading quite yet. We're just balancing stuff. We're just trying to make it look normal, right? And right now this looks really flat because it was shot in log. So I'm just gonna begin. Lift is, and you'll see this happening down here in the scopes. Lift is where the blacks sit, okay? So it's like black level, right? If this is too low, again, I'm clipping off shadows. I have no detail in here. I've lost my detail. And that may be what you want creatively, but right now I'm just balancing. I'm not making that decision yet. I wanna preserve these layers in here. There's like actually a layer of trees in front of this other layer of trees. And I wanna see that. Um, and what I'm doing here is zooming in and out. I am just kind of hovering over the picture and mouse wheel in and out to do that. If you ever need to reset it, you can come up here and hit fit. It'll put it. I like to kind of go a little further in just to get a bigger viewer, but you know, up to you how you want to do that. So fit puts it in the middle. If you want to move this around too, if you're zoomed in and you want to kind of go over here, you can hold down the middle mouse button, hold and drag, and it will navigate you around the image, kind of like a hand control in Photoshop. So that's useful. Back to fit. So lift, lift is the bottom of the signal. It's where the blacks sit. Again, it's like the, the, the bottom black level. I'm gonna skip one here and go to gain. This is like white level, okay? At what, what is the brightest, what's the brightest part of it? You know, how bright are we letting the image be? Is it like this? Is it like this? You know, this looks much more like early morning or darker, you know, I can kind of bring this down. But getting your luminance, in other words, you know, the brightness level is figured out. That's your first step. Do your, do your brightness stuff first, you know, then work with your color. You'll be so, so surprised. You don't actually need as much color information as you think if your brightness stuff is figured out first. So gain, again, I'm gonna stay shy of that 100% because there's just nothing really here that would be an actual blowout highlight. That just doesn't make sense for the scene. Um, so my gamma now, is the tricky one. Okay, now watch the scopes here. When I change gamma, and again, I'm looking at these, I'm grabbing these little wheels underneath. I'm not changing it here, I'm going here. And if you hover over these, you can also mouse wheel up and down. So gamma is usually referred to as midtones, but that's sort of a lie. Um, it's not really changing the midtones, but you see here that, you know, essentially the, the lights, the, the bright whites are staying kind of in the same spot. You know, they're not really moving. If you look at the sky up here, the, the darks are moving a little more, but essentially the black level is kind of staying the same and this is kind of moving the middle. What you're doing when you change gamma, and gamma is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but this is all you're doing when you change gamma. I'm using curves here real quick to show you. I'm gonna grab this. Lowering gamma, raising gamma. So it is midtones in the sense that you're working in the middle range here, but these stick at the end, okay? This is lift right? Black level. This is gain, white level. And here's gamma in the middle. This is showing me kind of what's the contrast curve or spread in the middle. And I'm looking for a spot that is, again, very kind of like realistic, like that looks too bright. That's crushed, right? Here I am. That looks pretty good. Lift gamma gain. Uh, so that works on the whole signal here. Offset, guys, this is just exposure, okay? It's got a fancy word, offset, whatever, but this is just exposure. See how the whole graph just moves? The whole thing, lifting it up, taking it down. You know, again, people might call this brightness. They might call it exposure or whatever. Some people also call gain brightness, but you know, you gotta know what's actually happening here. And if you look at the scopes, you can see on the waveform what's going on. So. You know, don't rely 100% on scopes. You know, perfect scope reading isn't going to give you the perfect image, but kind of rely on that left brain, right brain balance of art and science to get you there. So that's uh, that's how this moves everything together. If you click through these menus here, still on the primary primary wheels, if we go through to the second dot, which again in the menu here is bars, this is for balancing the three channels RGB. We're not going to mess with this because that's that's again kind of a a bit advanced way to go about things. If you want to start, you know, like mess, do some color mixing, this is how you do it eventually. Um, but again, you know, you kind of, it's hard to know what you're doing unless you really know, know your stuff here. So going to hit reset there, not going to mess with this middle one. I would encourage you only to go to the bars, color bars, um, after kind of learning the rest of the program. 
So I'm going to skip right on through to the third dot, which in the menu again is log. Now you were watching the, the scope behavior over here when we did lift gamma gain, but now we have these same wheels and offset still here, right? Offset still does the same thing. But when you're in log mode, you're actually working on ranges, little ranges of stuff. So, you know, lift was moving the whole bottom up, right? Gain was moving up the whole top. Log is gonna move sections, right? So shadow. Now look at the scopes, guys. That's just moving the bottom. You see how controlled that is? Like really just working on the shadows, nothing else is changing. That's brilliant. And you can set where that shadow range is um, by these things up here. Like you can see this dark gradient says range and this top white gradient says range. So that's like the, the cutoff point between shadow and midtone. So if I crank my shadows down and I move that range up, it's starting to eat, it's starting to eat more of the image as shadows, right? If I move that way down, it won't it's not gonna connect with it because it's out of the range, right? So you can kind of set the range as you want it. That's pretty nice because I've already got a lot of depth in these trees that I didn't have before. So again, shadows, just moving the bottom, bam. Okay, um, great. Now highlights, again, I'm gonna skip midtones. Highlights are doing the top, right? That's just the very top. Again, look at the, look at the graph, look at the scope here, just the top of the image, okay? So again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blow it out. I'm gonna kind of set it where I want it. And then midtones, you know, again, you can see that right there with those trees. Midtones is just working in the middle range. It's just moving this here. And the midtone doesn't have, um, you know, the midtone is set. The range is set by the shadow and highlight ranges because they're kind of on the either side of the midtones, right? There's a gap here between shadows and midtones, and like where is that threshold on the graph? That's all you're moving when you move this. So again, midtones, you know, again, I'm gonna go here. So typically what I'm doing is I'm working in primaries. Okay, I'm gonna do lift gamma gain. I'm gonna get in here and do a little, maybe a little bit of satch, uh, or sorry, not saturation, but shadow, midtone, and highlight. Chances are I don't need to use offset because I've already kind of corrected that. But if things come in, you know, real dark, then you can just kind of, you know, bring them up. And you'll start to, to kind of develop your eye. You'll start to see when things are weird or off or looking like they're breaking or something. Um, and it is possible to break your footage. Just keep that in mind. Every camera codec has a limit and you can find it. So just don't, don't push things too far. Um, you know, if you, go, if you go too far, you can start to get like weird, you know, you'll start to get weird stuff happening in here. Like this is looking pretty grainy and it's starting to kind of break a little bit. And that's not a good look. You want to keep things looking pretty. So shadows right there, highlights, great. Okay, here's an important button we got to learn right now. This little sparkly color thing up here on the right. Bypass color grades. Okay, so that just shuts off all color correction. This takes you back to original footage. And so, so far we can see that, okay, we brought back a lot of this kind of contrast detail in the bottom. If you are not getting the kind of balancing the highlight or the, the shadow and highlight and midtone balancing you want, then you can head over to your curves control here, which is this one right here. And it's just the first dot on the curves menu. Curves, there's actually like eight different types or I guess seven here. Yeah, through all these and we'll get there guys, don't worry. But this main one here curves, you know, this is like doing lift gamma gain, or here's the gamma. Um, but I like to go through from the bottom and say like, okay, I'm going to set this. I'm going to create some contrast there. I want those to come in darker. I'm, I'm grabbing it piece by piece and kind of setting where I want these to be. And there's a reason that Blackmagic Design, this is, this is one of their patents, actually. They hold a patent for this curves control because it is so dang cool. You can do so much and like control a lot with it. So again, here I am at the top. I'm kind of blowing this out and I can see that this is clipping too high. And again, I could really drag this. You don't want to do this, guys. This is breaking stuff, right? You never want to have an inverse curve. <laughs> Hopefully you've messed with this in Photoshop and you know why, um, but this is kind of the way. So I'm using curves to really sculpt. You know, if I can't get the, the contrast I want in here, I go to curves and I set it. So that's how I do that. 
And now let's look at all the other controls here really quick, these top and bottom. I will say that if you just stick in primaries here and you use all these and all these in the bottom, you're pretty good to go. Most of your work is gonna happen here. Um, and then the actual color wheels themselves, these are what start to actually shift color, right? So, so I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna start adding some saturation. Um, I've done a lot of contrast already. I've got my contrast set. So now I'm gonna add saturation. And that just starts to look a little unrealistic. So I'm gonna back it off, you know? And like I said, okay, this is like early morning fog. You know, we probably don't want like that much color because it's kind of pale. Your default was 50. And keep in mind, you can always double click and, you know, enter a number. So let's try 60. Let's go 70. That's pretty good. Not too bad. Okay, so saturation, you know, if you're shooting in log, it's going to be desaturated. So you get your contrast first, then you add color, right? If you don't want to see any color, take the saturation to zero, right? And then you can really see what we got here for contrast. And this is looking pretty good. So again, I'm going to go to 70 on this. Nothing wrong with playing around. Nothing wrong with experimenting. See what's up. Okay, so the next biggest thing after you've got your contrast and your saturation kind of set is your temperature. This is color temp, right? Hot, cold. So <laughs> this white balance control is, is lit. <laughs> you can really make it look like, oh, look, it's fire season again. Yay. Or like, you know, where are we? Like Alaska? <laughs> so again, you know, I think it was set at 5,000. Oops. No, sorry. That's the amount you're modifying it by, not the total Kelvin value. So zero is no change. I'm going to warm it up a touch, just like a hundred points, just to give it a little juice. Great. And then the other color balance thing is tint. So I'm noticing, and you guys are probably noticing too, this is looking a little pink, which is normal for the morning, but I feel like it could just get packed off a little bit, you know, kind of like that. So like that. And again, look at what's happening on the scope. So like, I'm kind of like, it's shifting the color balance it's shifting the amount of each color and rebalancing. Um, but the main thing is like, again, uh, green and magenta. This is like hot, cold, and this is green and magenta. So again, I could keep it here. I could keep it here. It's all, it's all up to your artistic decisions. Um, but again, probably just gonna keep this about negative 10 and just a little bit there. If you hold alt on the keyboard, look what happens, guys. You start to move things real slow. This is a great key to hit. DaVinci is powerful and a little goes a long way. So you can really like slam something accidentally. I, I would recommend in the beginning that you just kind of hold alt and go slow. And you can see the waveform moving really slowly and be like, okay, fine tuning. And that's it right there. I'll let it go. Negative four, not much change. At this point, I want to compare. Is it better? Yeah, yeah, I improved it. I did a little bit. It's, it's getting there. Okay, cool. So, you know, we, we touched these bottom wheels here for lift gamma gain and then also for log, which is shadow midtone highlight. These are just different ways of separating the contrast ranges, right? So I'm actually seeing that this is clipping the bottom off a little bit here. So I'm gonna go back to my lift, bring it back. Nothing wrong with going back to these at all. You know, you're gonna make color changes and contrast changes you want to be able to go back here and kind of change this stuff because it's going to it's going to shift. So that's okay. Now we're not clipping blacks. That's great. Very good. Okay, cool. Yeah, looking good. Okay, everything else here. So contrast, again, a very tempting one, guys, very tempting. But contrast is what we did. We built our own contrast curve here, right? And we did it here. So I don't actually ever use this. I don't ever use contrast because this is like the computer deciding for me what the contrast should look like. And that just looks horrible. No one wants that. So try to do things yourself if you can. Don't rely on this. It's kind of a, like a very basic control that doesn't give you a lot of, well, control. And pivot sets kind of where, where that contrast pivot is. Again, I would throw that out. Don't really use that. Um, low range and high range. Again, these are where the shadows and midtones sort of clip off. And um, these will change up here as you go through these menus. But if you go back to primaries here again, color wheels, first dot. The other stuff you need to know, we already did saturation. Uh, hue is literally going to take your rainbow and it's going to like spin it. Um, it's going to say like blue is teal and teal is yellow and yellow is red and red is orange and like spin it down the color wheel. 
to show you this, I'm going to go to my scope options here. I'm going to choose um, vector scope. Tiny little bit of dots here. I'm going to go to my settings, show 2x zoom, and you want colorize turned on too. That just like helps you a little bit. You're like, okay, what's here? Check that out. That's all good to go. So this is showing a scatter plot of the color information and kind of where it's sitting. So right now, you know, you can see this is yellow, red, magenta, uh, blue, cyan, and green. Everything is not really centered around this middle dot. It's kind of up, pushing up toward, you know, a little out toward yellow, mostly up toward red and magenta. So again, offset is going to do everything at once. It's going to move all of it together, right? Gain's going to move just the top. The, the whites and the mids sort of. The gamma is going to move the middle. Lift is going to move the bottom. And by bottom, again, I mean darkest part. So if I just grab this middle, and again, be careful, guys. A little goes a long way. This is where we start to get into color correction, okay? So this is like, you can see the, the dot moving a little bit here, but look at the vector scope. It's literally corresponding. Like if I scoot this offset over to the right, it pushes it to the right. Push to the left, it's going to the left. It's, it's rebalancing the colors based on what's happening here. And this is actually what's happening if I go to the bar. See how offset has bar values now? But again, stay away from that. It's kind of complex. I can click reset on the offset and bring it back. Anytime you see a little reset, a little um, spiral, you know, a little circle arrow thing here, that's a reset. You can do all the primaries. You can reset all your primaries up here by clicking this. I'm not going to do that. Reset all is the plus in the middle there. You can see that. So, um, okay, so we've done saturation, um, hue. Now, if I go again with hue, I'm going to spin this around the color wheel. So it's just changing the colors, spinning it around, saying this color is actually the next one to the right. Um, and this can get pretty crazy and drastic. So again, I would not really be changing this a lot. This is more like if your if your camera is kind of just like a little bit biased to one color, try hue, you know, try to spin it and get it into like a different range. Like that's interesting, right? That's not totally unrealistic. It's really stylized. And I'm already starting to create a look, right? So if I'm making a look on top of my balancing, hue is one way to you can you can kind of go go about it that way. But I'm gonna keep this at neutral just to show you other stuff. Saturation, we did that. Highlight, shadow. This is another way right here of doing shadow and highlight. Again, because we have this in the log controls, I don't do it. I don't mess with shadow or highlight. So, you know, other colorists will tell me why I'm totally wrong, but, you know, this is how I do it. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Uh, second to last thing here color boosts. This is like vibrance. If you ever use Lightroom or Photoshop, this is going to saturate, like look at the vector scope. This grows all these colors out. It's going to saturate the less saturated colors more. Stuff that has less color information is going to get more saturated. Stuff that has already a lot of color, it's not going to get touched a lot. So again, be careful. You know, you might want to juice everything up with this, but hold it up. Look what's happening. We're breaking it, right? Back that off. We're not breaking it. And in fact, this actually, if I take this down, what I do is I start to knock out the more saturated colors and kind of flatten the color contrast. So, you know, don't really need to do that. Keep that back there. Okay, last thing is mid detail, mid-tone detail. Uh, if you guys, again, if you edited photos in Lightroom, this is, you know, this is like, uh, I think they call it, what's the name? Oh, clarity, they call it clarity, that's what it is. So you start to crank this up and look what happens. We get a harder, a harder look. Edges tend to get more defined. Take it the other way, it softens everything and edges are less defined. So like this up here is totally hazy, this, this edge. And if I take it back up again, look how crisp that gets, right? Now, a lot of people get into Vinci, they start getting all, trigger happy and they start dialing everything to 100 because it looks super contrasty and cool. Well, for a landscape like this, that's great. When you start working with people, it's gonna make their faces look really old and tired and wrinkly. <laughs> so actually a good way to de-age people in DaVinci is to take to, to just select their face and then do like a 
you know, take the mid-tone detail down, that's a bit of a beauty trick, just so you know. Okay, so that's it here. I'm gonna take this to about 30. And then I've also seeing that my, my color balance is sort of up, kind of pushed toward red, magenta, yellow. And I kind of want it sitting more on the, the center line there. So I'm gonna grab offset and I'm gonna bring it in and see how I can reposition the, the data right into the middle of the graph. Like, yeah, we got this stuff hanging off the left here. And that's fine, but really we want to kind of balance everything back, right? We were up here and now we want to be here. It's not as saturated and as crazy, but it's rebalancing it and putting it down here. Now, what happens if I just do the gain, right? Okay, that's working mainly on the brights, yeah? Okay, so that's cool, maybe something there. And I'm starting to work everything back into the middle, see that? Gamma. Same deal, kind of working on the middles there, bring it into the middle. And lift is the bottom. Oops, don't want to change the wheel. I want to change the, the not the dial, but the, the color wheel here. And again, this is like, you see how I'm just shifting the shadow color, right? So thinking in, in shadows, midtones, and highlights, you want to be thinking in like bright, medium, and dark. And what are the darks doing? What are the mediums doing? What are the brights doing? That's kind of how you're going to build a look in DaVinci. How are we doing on time? 12.20, great. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, given all this information that we just went through, I know that was a lot. Um, I'm gonna just quickly use this info and take us through a really quick balancing of everything. So this is what I would do first, right? And again, I'm comparing, did I make it better? Yeah, love it, cool. This is nothing fancy, no real grading. This is just a balance. And now I'm gonna go back to clips and I'm just gonna bang right through these. So here we are, shot number two, clips off. And again, there, I, I just clicked on shot two. Uh, this shows you the codex. This is showing, okay, it's DNX HR. Great, cool. Um, one has the coloring on it already. You can see that. I've also got audio shut off here, just so you guys know. So we're not kind of like messing with that sound and getting that distraction. It's just right here. Let me turn that on and off. And when you're on the uh, edit page, just so you know, that moves down here to the right. That's this. So. If you ever have no sound and you're banging your head against your keyboard, try this right here. It might be that. Okay. So again, lift gamma gain. I'm going to go through real quick, real quick and dirty. I'm just going to get this done. This is how I would do a real color workflow. And I'm going to waveform. And I'm really quickly just going to balance. So the highlights look good. The shadows look good. The mids are low. I'm going to bring those up. Saturation. That looks realistic, probably. Midtone detail. Again, I don't want to crank it, but usually around 30 or 40 is nice. Hue, I mean, now you can really see what Hue is doing. Like we're literally spinning this around the color wheel. Not usually a great look, but could be used creatively. Like right now, if I set it to 54, I'm spinning everything a little bit toward red. And you can see that the kind of sun or the, the sunrise gets that red back and everything's not so kind of green biased, which is nice. So a little bit there is fine. Color boost, just a touch. And then again, I'm going back to uh, log and I'm gonna do shadow midtone highlight and give my shadow some, some grittiness there. Midtones, a little bit make the wine, the winery pop out there, the wine grapes and highlights. Again, be careful. That looks nice, but we're actually blowing it out. We don't want that. If you really wanna see the histogram too, just go to it, check it out. Probably pretty familiar with this thing, right? So, you know, again, highlights. We're seeing that like, like, look at that. I'm just clipping that right off the edge. You don't want to do that. Bring it back. You know, if you don't know where it is, go to histogram and bam, not bad. We're also, we're, we're running the risk of clipping the greens, the green channel here, but that's okay. And you can adjust individual channels later. Okay, so um, this one looks pretty balanced. I'm looking at mid-tone here. Again, temp, uh, colder, it's the morning. You know, it's not like sunset. Tint, just writing these. I'm not looking at the numbers, guys. I'm looking at the frame. Train your eye on the frame. Go real slow, hold Alt. And when it looks good, just stop. Don't go any further. Bam, what did I land on? 12, not that much. Okay, great. 
We are getting ready for another question break here pretty soon. So you guys won't have any questions, feel free to start typing those in. I can't see the chat box, so just go for it. And Brandon will get those in a minute. So, okay, that's histogram, great. I'm gonna go back to waveform because it shows me all, all this info. Okay, clips. So, you know, how am I doing between these two? Well, okay, you know, this is pretty, this looks pretty magenta and hot. You know, I might actually start to cool this down again. I'm looking at my sky here, you know, I wanna see those purples line up. That's better, you know, we're getting, we're getting closer. We're gonna fine tune this later, so don't worry too much. Now, here's a cool thing, guys. This is something you should all know. To copy your settings from clip to clip, um, you know, to copy stuff, all you do is you go to the new clip where you want the settings to go to, and then you uh, middle mouse click on the clip you want to pull from. So you're pulling it, you're not copying and pasting onto, you're pulling from what's here. So I'm going to go to my new one, which has no color correction, right? This is not lit up. Middle mouse button click, bam, and here we are. So this, this is applying the same settings, the exact same settings I did to this, to this. Now, they don't look quite the same, but it gives me a starting point. And, I'm, and if I'm thinking about creating kind of a look or a world here, I wanna balance everything together. I wanna to correct it together and get it really like in the same world. My vector scope shows me, oh my God, yellows are just going crazy here. So I might take my gamma or my gain or my lift and kind of pull this over. Looks better, right? Colder, warmer. I'm gonna do that. My waveform is probably gonna show me I don't have deep shadows. Yeah, shadows aren't hitting. So lift, pull the darks down. Again, I wanna check this, am I destroying detail? That's destroying detail, there's nothing here now. So too far. You know, the blue channel I can see is hitting the bottom here, so great. And I might pull the rest of my shadows under with log, third thing here. Okay, great. Going on through, that looks pretty good. You know, it's not perfect, but we're just, we're just cruising on through here, trying to get this a little more balanced. I'm gonna save, don't forget to save. And yes, I haven't saved this yet. So I'm gonna call this wine spec two. I've already done another one. So I'm gonna call it number two and hit save. Live save is enabled, so we're good, but it doesn't hurt to hit command S every once in a while. <laughs> good habit to have. And so now I'm gonna just gonna keep balancing. Okay, we're back to ground footage. So this is ground from a tripod, air, air, ground, 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 ground. This was actually, believe it or not, taken with a drone, low altitude, and then ground again. So thinking about, you know, if I copy my settings from a aerial shot onto a ground shot like this, it's not gonna look right because we have different cameras, right? So you wanna copy stuff from the same camera usually. So what we'll do is, again, go back to my primaries, nothing fancy, waveform, like, wow, look at that. That's not spread out at all. So I'm gonna do that, bottom level, top level, really spreading this out, guys. I'm spreading out the contrast here, gamma. That's better, right? Oh yeah, much better, a little dark. So middle gamma up, I am clipping some stuff here. So I will go to my log for highlights. And if I set my range high enough, just the top range, I'm setting it around to 896 here, this top line or second to top line, then I can just pull those in. Let's see what that does. So like here's a specular highlight, right? That's clipping. And I can see because again, left to right looking here, okay, here's this range that's clipping right here. And it's like the same territory this zone. And we just don't want to have that blow out because your eye is going to go right there. And we're not trying to lead the eye to this like weird bright spot. We're trying to lead the eye to the grapes, right? That's the sauce. So don't be afraid to just take that down. Look at that. Look beautifully. That's just not even there anymore. I mean, what a difference. So great. De-emphasize that. And remember, you want to correct, you know, using kind of what the hero frame of the shot is, right? So what are the elements here? I got hands, grapes, and I got some scissors. I really want those scissors to be visible because that's the action. So 
you know, I'll probably stick with like a frame like here where I can see everything, right? If the frame starts with someone that's looking down and they look up in the shot, well, why would you correct it when they're looking down, right? You wanna see their face. And we'll get to a, a character shot next year. So, okay, again, you know, brightness, I'm doing some mid-tone detail that pops it a little better. Get out of there. Okay, I see a little much, too much, too much. Uh, go to my spectroscope. Back to my regular primaries, gamma, you know, bring this over. And again, very small adjustments, lots of tiny little adjustments here. That is too magenta looking. So I'll correct that. And get some gain back up. Cool. Compare, contrast. Literally, contrast. Look at that. Bam. All we did was adjust contrast. I haven't even touched the color yet. Wow. Saturation up and like, whoa, I just don't need much. You know, that's like, that's neon. That's too much. So we're going to go like 60, which is like 10% over. Not much. And again, hue, you know, be careful. Don't use this unless you're really doing something to like everything with the hue and only small amounts. Um, one little trick I do like to do that kind of gives things a more film look is I will rotate this to like 52. And you can see the soil looks rich and the leaves look rich and everything just kind of just gets a little more red and juicy. So that's helpful for skin tones too. Um, okay, that looks good. And I can hit this next right here to go to my next one. I don't have to go to clips and access that. So moving on with balancing, this one is real flat. Oh boy, this is gonna be a challenge. Okay, let's just try to copy, right? We're in the vineyard, we're in the grapes. Let's just copy it. Ah, that didn't work. Okay, well, that's all right. I could copy it to get my color settings the same and then I can adjust from there. So let's just try that. Let's see like, okay, can I actually bring this back given what's already happened? And I mean, things are starting to kind of shift around. So I'm going to say no, <laughs> no, I can't. And another way to, to um, reset your clip is to go here, go to nodes. Here's your node, right click and say reset back to nothing. And that's okay. You know, it's fine to start from scratch. No shame there. Hey, Jesse, uh, yes. actually, could I pause you for a second? We have a question in the chat um, from Bono. Uh, so the question Great. is, what's the difference between settings like saturation, hue, temperature on the wheels tab versus the log tab? Got it. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, so primaries and log are just two different ways to separate, um, to kind of, to, to segment the information, right? So primaries, again, is working on the entire, um, the whole bottom. It's lifting the whole, the whole black level up and, and kind of squishing everything together. Primaries is gonna work on these broad sections like I was showing you. Um, let me just do this one real quick to show you. So again, primaries, it's like everything is changing, right? Like the whole image is getting worked on. I can go up to here and find some contrast. And again, like these broad sweeping adjustments that are like changing everything. I'm not gonna worry about this blowout right here. We'll get to that in a second. I'm looking at her face because that's really what I wanna be correcting for. Finding a good shot. And again, her face is too blown out. So again, this is like changing the whole graph. See, this is all moving together. If I go to log, it's just moving the top. See that on the, on the graph? It's just, control. it's more controlled. It's more surgical and it's acting only on that. So that's for brightness. When you do the wheels, the color wheels, it's also gonna work on those, only on those ranges, right? So if I wanted the shadows to be like super warm, pow, push that over to red or, uh, orange right and now the shadows are all like really warm but everything else stays the same so if i do that in uh primaries it's going to be a much bigger like look at that the whole thing is getting orange or uh you know kind of yellow right so it's about how surgical you want to be um the last part of your question saturation hue all that those are global okay so these things down here and up here are global and are going to act on the entire frame the only things that segment are whether you're in primaries or in log right here again. So your log, you're dividing up things into ranges, highlight, middle, and shadow. Truly these three separate ranges that don't touch each other and don't get modified. 
and then the, the primary wheels are more of those broad sweeping ranges, right? So again, you know, just to demonstrate, like if I do my gain, which is my brights and, and primary, if I push the gain, it like, I'm just, I'm pushing it toward blue right now, see that? It's it's moving the whole top end of it. Like the, the bottom is not moving that much, but it's really pushing the whole thing over. And I really just encourage you guys to, um, to mess with this and start to kind of get a feel of what these different things do. Um, watching the scopes, watching the vector scope and the waveform will show you sort of what you're doing. Um, so if I wanted that to be back to where it was, I don't know why this, there we go. Um, again, I just did that like all the blue right on the gain. But then what if I do it only on my log on the highlights, right? See that? Just the highlights, just that little part getting changed, just the top end. So log is more surgical. It's more for like individual shadow, midtone, and highlight adjustments. While primaries, you know, like the, the regular wheels, lift gamma gain are just for the kind of broad um, balancing adjustments. I hope that answers the question. You'll, you'll get a feel for it more as you start to work in here, but you know, just kind of two different ways of attacking things. Usually I'm not starting in log mode. I'm, I'm going to primary wheels first, lift gamma gain, get this dialed in, and then I shift over to here when I wanna do like, you know, more controlled stuff. Like, like this contrast is good here, but now I want to actually pull this highlight down. So I'll do that just right here. And look at that, I recovered the whole thing. Okay. Um, we are gonna, uh, we'll do more questions in a second. I'm just gonna finish balancing all these. And so right now I'm seeing I want more saturation. That looks great. Next, quick and dirty guys, just real, real fast through here. Just looking for natural, I want natural. Okay, highlights, pulling those down. See that, pull the highlights back down, great. And now this one's a little tricky because if I go back and just adjust these, I'm not quite getting the contrast I want. So I will go to curves. This is a regular curves control. And I'll start to just kind of build this up from here. And that's much more stylized, right? If I reset that, yeah, not as much contrast. Redo. Oops, actually that was be that would be an undo. Yeah, so. There we go. So I've used my primaries and my curves to get my contrast. And now I'm just gonna go to my color, punch it up and there's my blue grapes. Beautiful. Next, I don't really know what I'm looking at here. This is a little trickier. So I'm gonna go over, scrub through this and you know, you can just grab this little uh, shuttle here and pull it around. This is like a wine, I don't know what they're doing. I think it's like squeezing the grapes or it's like taking the stems off or something. <laughs> There's a lot of steam coming up, it's kind of cool. So again, shadows, am I clipping them? No, gain up, contrast. And again, I've already gotten a lot of my color back by just adjusting the contrast, or at least the perception of color. Add the color back in, looking a little bit warm. I'm gonna use middle gamma for that, pull that back, good. And now the highlight or the shadows are looking a little blue now. So I'm gonna pull that the other way. And again, you know, be be careful. <laughs> it can go it can go a long way here with a little little bit of action. So that's pretty good. Before, after, hello. Now I can see everything. Great. Whole thing looks a little cold, so I will punch it up on the warmth. Next. Now this one is kind of a unicorn. This clip already has very much the contrast we want for some reason. I don't know why, but it just does. So that's okay. Um, I'm seeing that like the sky here is totally blown. So, you know, I can bring the gain down, but ultimately there's this flat line right here where everything's just kind of like blowing off the, the top of the, the brightness range. So I can't really do that. I can't really fix much, you know, that's, that's too bad. So try not to shoot, you know, try not to shoot overblown footage if you can help it. So for that, I will just go to, again, log mode just to control the highlights. And I will try to pull those down individually just to kind of help it not be like, wah. <laughs> pull 
pull that down a little bit. And now I've controlled the highlights, I've got some more wiggle room here and I can actually push the whole thing back up, add some gain back in. And the overall top brightness value has lowered. See that it's brighter, lower, it just kind of helps a little bit. Then I'll go to saturation, that's too much. White balance. You can also do auto here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend clicking auto. It kind of does some strange things sometimes. And um, the white balance tool will do your temp and tint. So let's just try that real quick. Let's try to white balance on like, say this like crate out here. So pretty close, it was already pretty close there. Didn't change the temp too much. It just kind of cooled it off, negative value here. And the tint, it pushed it a little more magenta, which is fine with me. That looks pretty good. And then we'll kind of click click through here, make sure there's a little bit of a camera shake, kind of moves a little bit, which is weird, which we can take care of later. And uh, maybe a little gamma, just kind of bring up the mids and some mid-tone, again, mid-tone detail, you know, it's gonna make it really crunchy looking. I'm gonna stay at like 60, that'll be great. Okay, cool. Hue, not touching that. I don't need to mess with that. Color boost, nah. Okay, now here's not the frame I want to color correct, right? Here's a focus pull. Find your frame first. Here it is. You know, why would I, why would I correct this when I could correct this? And again, primaries, wheels. Looking at my waveform. <laughs> this bag looks pretty funny on the, uh, the waveform, the type. This is the type right here. You can see this, these darker patches right here. <laughs> So I'm gonna bring the lift down, bring the gain up. Now the highlights are blown. This is pretty standard, guys. You're gonna pull the lift down. You're gonna push the gain up. You're gonna pull these highlights down too. Make sure your range is high enough so it doesn't touch this stuff only above that. And now I have control over what's happening there. Great. Saturation, checking it, turning it on and off. Wow, look at that waveform. That's like fully expressed. This is like full amount of color. If I go to the uh, vector scope, same thing. Tiny amount of color, huge amount of color, right? Pretty good. And like, again, offset, you know, I could bring this, I could bring it more warm. I could bring it colder. I'll probably push it warmer because it's the ending shot. You want to leave people with a nice, pretty end shot. So, so there's that. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to my clips and kind of see how I did. Right, look through here. Okay, you know, pretty good, pretty good, not too bad. If I wanna see everything bigger, I can click right up here in Lightbox. And now I've got all my shots and I can dial these up or down and be like, okay, cool, here's my edit. You know, here's my actual, um, all my shots, right? This is like your, uh, what do you call it in photography? Um, it's like a film strip view, you know? So, you know, I can see that some of these are a little, you know, some are warmer, some are colder, like this shot's pretty cold, you know, now I could come back here and turn off Lightbox and be like, you know what, let's warm that up a little bit. That's good. Always watching for skin tone, you know, like this is a little warm, but I want to make sure it's realistic. Like, okay, she looks pretty realistic for skin tone there. This is probably a good time to, to talk about the skin tone line. And then we'll open it up for questions. So on the settings here. This is just something for the vector scope. Okay, so I did not understand this and I thought it was super weird and out of place when I, when I learned about it, but uh, it'll make sense once, once I explain. So skin tone indicator. Okay, so first when I saw this, I thought, wait a minute, why is this program telling me what people's skin tone should be? That's ridiculous, right? Like, who are they to say? Well, oddly enough, no matter anyone's complexion or skin tone, you know, lighter or darker, actually it does fall kind of on this range. So if you were to pull, um, this is a tough one because there's lots of colors here, but most stuff, um, most skin tone actually, you know, again, no matter how light or dark or any, any color, it actually sort of does fall on this line. And this is something I, I looked up and researched and I thought, oh, this is total BS. They're just saying this to sell the, you know, the program or whatever, but it is true. So <laughs> uh, the program's not being weird racially. It's actually trying to help you out a little bit and say, hey, you know, most stuff is gonna sit kind of on this mostly red um, and kind of brown line um, regardless of skin tone. So 
it can be helpful um, in kind of making sure your skin tone looks correct. But at the end of the day, your eye is gonna know instantly. Our eyes are so good at knowing what humans look like. You know, they'll know the second something is off or weird way before a scope will. So just a couple quick words on that. Um, okay, so we've done all of our balancing. We're looking pretty good here. Warm that up, warm that up. It's, you know, the idea is like, they just wanna live in the same world. You know, we've, we've kind of balanced all these and uh, again, checking it against, against the original, checking, checking. Yep, all improvements, really great. Love it, happy. Okay, so that is primaries. And at this point, we've been going a little more than an hour and a half. So um, let's, I will open it back up for questions. And then we take a quick bathroom break for three minutes and then we're gonna keep hauling onward. So with that, uh, Brandon, do we have any questions with uh, primaries and balancing? Uh, no questions in the chat just yet, but- um. Wow, I, okay. Yeah. Well, it either means uh, this is working or I'm going way too fast. <laughs> so, um, and you know, Brandon too, if you, if you have any questions, feel free to just chime in too. Okay, of course, yeah. So, okay, guys, so I'm going to go on mute for three minutes. Um, it's, we're halfway through, so I'm just going to, um, I'll be back in two minutes here, and we will resume Play Jeopardy music. Awesome. All right, we are back. Awesome. You know what, Jesse? I do have a question. Do you yeah. mind uh, recapping kind of the the order in which you you go about your your coloring workflow? So I know you start with um, the the contrast first with with your lift and uh, what was it called? Uh, lift and yeah. lift and gain. Lift, yeah. Lift lift gain and gamma. Yeah. 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 Happy to do that. So. Yeah, so my thinking with, with the order here is first get your, you know, treat everything like a black and white photograph and get your tones figured out, get your contrast figured out, right? Doing that first will allow you so much more control over the image later. It kind of gives you a foundation to build off of because, you know, if the image is, is really nice and tonal like this without any color, uh, it's just going to set you up for success. Like your contrast is already here. So then when you start to add color back, you're adding color to a nice contrasty image. And like, 
you know, okay, this is already looking pretty good. This is actually less color than the clip came with. You know, this was at 50, if you remember, right? So um, you'd be surprised, you know, once you get your contrast, how little color you need to kind of make it pop. So that's why we do uh, contrast first, you know, and again, I'm using the primary wheels here and then the primary log controls. And they look the same, but they do different stuff in terms of segmentation. As soon as I get the contrast the way I want it, then I'm headed into color and I'm actually gonna do color stuff. And the first thing to think about once I'm adding color back is temperature, right? Like, you know, hot, cold, tint, which is green magenta. And like, look, look at the vector scope. It's just literally moving it across the graph. It's just scooting it around, right? So if I just use the vector scope, it kind of looks like maybe like here would be good. But then I look at it and I'm like, ah, oh, that's too magenta. So let's get out of there. That's more like it right there. So, you know, first it's color balance, right? Temp and tint. And then lastly, then I'm finally going into the color wheel portions here, which are very sensitive and very, uh, they're really, really touchy. So that's just to kind of balance color last. And, you know, I'm visiting those, I'm going back and visiting those constantly, even after I've graded like a whole grade on something just because things shift, you know, I need to go back and make basic adjustments. I need to go back and make those basic adjustments once I've done the higher level stuff because things just kind of shift a little as you go. So it's contrast and then it's color balance and then it's color, you know, sort of, well, more color balance, but kind of color bias, I guess you'd say with this. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the thinking there. After that, you know, and this is what we're gonna move into. Um, after that, then I'm thinking about secondary color correction. And so that's a great, that's a great segue to the next section. Okay, so a little review. Um, so the primaries or um, balancing as it's called, um, again, you're working on the entire image, right? I know that we're like, we're segmenting things into like different shadow, midtone, highlight ranges, but essentially you're just provide, you're saying, do this operation to all the highlights do this operation to all the midtones and do this operation to all of the shadows. You know, so it's separated in terms of brightness, but you're working, you're instructing the whole image to do those changes, right? I'm not just working on this one little highlight part right here, right? It's actually saying all the highlights of the image get this change, right? So um, secondaries in contrast to primaries, secondaries are where you only want to work on a small, section of the image, right? So like, what if I wanted to work on just the grapes? Or what if I want to work on just the green, okay? So this is grading, guys. Now we're getting into secondaries, which is grading, which is like style territory. So I'm gonna go to the shot with the character here, this woman picking grapes, and I'm gonna choose a nice, strong, sharp still. Where you can see that everything's sharp in her face. Probably right there is a good one. Yeah, that's great. Okay, cool. So secondaries, we're working on a part of the image, right? So there are two main ways to to do this. Um, we can do we can section off the image um, spatially. In other words, like with masks and wind. They're called windows, but you know I can say, oh, okay, on the right side do something, but don't do it to the left. That's a way of selecting, right? And the second way of selecting is just by color. So I can select and say, hey, I want just this color, just the sections with this color in it to be changed, right? So let's look at the first one here. So now we're gonna move through another um, color control here, right? We were on this wheels and now we're gonna go over to uh, window right here. It looks like a little mask, a circular mask with splines. Click on window. Now we have options, okay? We have shapes. So. I can click these. And before I go and start getting crazy on the masks and the windows here, I'm gonna go to my nodes. And this is where I'd want to make another node, guys. So here's the here's the main node, right? This is my balance. It's always, the first node is always gonna be your balancing. I'm gonna hit Alt S because, you know, so if I if I do a mask on this first one without making a new node, it's just going to affect that one portion, right? So here's a, here's a really quick basic mask, right? But wait a minute, this is like doing the entire balance I just did only to this top section. I don't want that, right? 
I balanced it already and I want to start with this. So Alt S on the keyboard and it stand, S is for serial node, which means serial as in like they're just in order, boom, boom, boom. You know, you can go as many as you want. So Alt S, new serial node. And so now I have this new node where this is, this is all done. I, I've done this work, I can hang this up to dry. Now I'm gonna go for this next one. And this is where I'm gonna do secondaries, okay? So let's do that again. Now I'm gonna grab this gradient one. And the gradient one is actually the most basic. I know these are all fun shapes to look at, but the gradient one is really such a powerful tool because it's just dividing up the image into two sections, okay? And the section that you're selecting with this is the section opposite of the arrow. I know this is a little weird, but check out this node thing right here, right? Let me zoom these in. Check out this node, guys. Here's first node, here's second node. As I move this up, up and back, you can see that this is showing me, okay, cool. That's what I'm affecting. Gray on the nodes are always gonna be uh, transparency, right? And if I click this wand up here on the left, this wand button is your friend, okay? This is where you can really be like, what do I wanna pick, right? Now I know that the right, the right side of the frame is super bright and it kind of distracts me from her face. Honestly, I want to see her eye. I want to see your hands. I want to see her working here. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to damage that, right? I want to preserve this stuff and then mess with this. And then the arrow and the angle are sort of how you set this, right? So I'm going to set a really long. Uh, it's called a fall off. You know, you don't want to do. You don't want to do a sharp edge. This is not a good look, guys. You don't want to go like that because then you know. <laughs> You know, now I can do, okay, now I'm just gonna do my standard stuff, but it's only working here, right? So now, you know, if I do gain or whatever, turn off my wand, I mean, geez, that's not great, right? It's just like a really harsh transition. I'm gonna pull that transition bigger. And now I'm basically kind of relighting the scene. But instead of brightening that, I'm gonna dip it down. Take that down. Now look at that. Wow. Okay. Before? After. I mean, just that one secondary adjustment right there is so much better. I can see her face. I'm not staring at this highlight on the right side. You know, it's instantly just giving me, giving me what I want. Okay, this is great. So now I can kind of readjust and say, okay, where am I shading this off? So some people call this relighting a scene. Uh, you'd be surprised how much this happens and you'll never notice it. Um, other things you can do, you know, like I, all I did on the masked region here on the windowed region is adjust the gain, which is a great way to adjust brightness. You know, I could adjust the offset up and down, but it, it's less believable that that would be lit that way. If I change the gain, I'm, I'm keeping the kind of darker parts the same and I'm just changing the top end of the gain, right? What else can I do in a mask? Well, you can do anything you want, honestly. So you pick the area and the area just sticks to the node you're working in. And now this node is a fresh node that has all these controls. So I could go in here and I could do curves on just the right side. God, why would we do that? That's horrible. But you know, those are the types of things you can do. So I could, a little trick might be like, okay, I'm on the right side here with this window and I'm gonna desaturate the right side. Okay, now obviously, too much, right? But if I just go up back to 50 and take it down to here, you see what that does? Now your eye is just going straight over to her. So the eye is gonna go toward contrast and bright colors, okay? So now I've really made the viewer just only look at her. And I can back this off, you know, I can go like this, but Desaturating is a great way to de-emphasize something. And most of the time, if I'm gonna turn down brightness, I'm also gonna turn the saturation down a little bit. It's a great trick, okay? So what if I don't want this shading, this one little shady shape, right? Well, I can turn that off and let's check these other shapes out. Okay, here's a box, right? Box is great. Hey, what's the box good for? Well, you know what? We have a clip the box would be great for. It's this. Right, so find our hero. The camera does not pan or move, thank goodness. It's just a rack focus. So, oops, I forgot to create my second node, guys. There it is, Alt S, second node. And now I can get my box 
you know, it's, it's, you can actually change the box a little bit first, like to change it so you can see kind of where you're operating, right? You can also do that, but I like to do it with it on. So I'm gonna choose the whole bag and I'm gonna move this over and I'm gonna go off the frame. See how I'm kind of going off the frame here. This box can be, you know, it's just a four, four spot polygon or it's a four, you know, it's just a, doesn't have to be a perfect square or whatever. So again, I've kind of chosen this and now look, I've chosen the bag. Uh, you can see the fall off here. If you click down here on the left and say off, you can see it without the bag, or sorry, without the uh, the spline on, without the, the boundary. It's nice for getting it right. So again, I don't really want too long of a fade here because this actually is a hard edge. So this is a situation where I'd wanna use a close fall off, a small feather. And again, you can change that here by going to soft. There's soft controls for one, two, three, four, or you can gra grab the red and just adjust it. So I'm gonna bring it in tighter. And I don't have to deal with the uh, the top and bottom because they're not on the screen. There's a little spill here from the, the back, you know, looking through the bag, but I'm not gonna worry about that. So what am I gonna do to this bag? I am going to, I am gonna brighten it. And again, I'm checking now that I got the area, I'm gonna turn off my spline and I'm gonna just turn it on and off. Okay, so right there, there's a secondary adjustment we just did, um, but we're getting some glow. See this little glow right here? So I have to turn that back on, power window, and I'm gonna move it in back to there and spread it out a little bit. It's okay to have it, you know, and you'll, you'll see, you know, kind of what looks best, but right now that's pretty good. I'm not, I'm not seeing, I'm not really seeing the effect. You know, you want to feel it, you don't want to see it. If the effect you're doing is felt and not seen, then you are winning at life. <laughs> uh, you're winning at color grading. Okay, cool. So that's soft, that's soft, that's fine. And now, what else do I want to do here? Well, okay, that's the box, right? Cool, fine. What other shapes do we have? Well, we've got the circle, which, you know, that's a pretty obvious one, right? I mean, circle is, I don't know where I'd use it on this because I don't have a lot of circle stuff. I find myself using the circle where I've got people because I want their faces to kind of be, you know, um, a certain way. I could go to this clip of our character here, not use this box, it's horrible. Do this, get over to her. And, you know, I could do something on her I could uh, reset go up, you know, I could, I could do like a, like a little spotlight right here on her. Right. So again, we're not seeing the effect. We're just feel we're, you know, we're feeling it. We're like, Oh, cool. Now I can see your face. The problem is now I've, I've blown my highlights and I probably have to go and recover them using the old log highlights trick. And there it is back in business, baby. All right. So this is power windows, okay? And power windows, I will say, you know, again, there's there's more shapes, guys. You can check these all out yourself, but another really good one, the last good one I'll, I'll show you is the pen tool. So like, what if I had this and I wanted to change it? More specifically, I could delete the square and I could go in here and pick a pen and I can just like do my, I can do my splines, you know, be like, get the bag curvature, like perfect. You know, I can go in here and like, and this depends on like how much your client's paying you, right? <laughs> if this is for yourself, you probably go crazy on your passion projects or whatever, but if you're under the deadline and you gotta make it happen, it depends on how, how crazy you can get, but that's a better pick. That's a better pick out than the, uh, the square, you know, because it follows the real shape of the bag. So if you need something specifically, the pen tool will get it done. And, you know, it's really just square, circle, pen, or what I call gradient, which is like a shader, you know, shade, um, fall off or whatever so okay so there's that and again i'd have to adjust my my uh my feathering and all that jazz but um you know you can do that down here down here too big shrink that mask in about to there that's better so let me show you one last thing with windows windows again being the first way of two ways to do secondary selection so, um, you know what? One last thing too, let me just do this. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. Just want you guys to know this. So 
with masks also, you know, if you're selecting an area, it's going to default select the area inside of the mask shape. But if you click this right here, if you click the um, little invert, it swapped that just now. See that? So now it's actually doing all that same stuff on the outside, everything outside and preserving. So it's like inside or outside. Would, do you want to swap the mask? And that's super useful if you want to exclude something instead of like choose it. Good to know there. So again, inverting mask, you click this and it shows the little dot changing here and you can switch what you're doing. And you know, same way, like look here, you can see it's picking everything but or that. So anyway, okay, great. So that's, that's basic windowing. And then I'm gonna show you one little quick other thing you can do with windowing. So what if this, what if it changes, right? We have this nice brighter green patch in here and I don't want, you know, the shots moving, maybe I want to do something to this right side, these right grapes with the workers, but I don't want to affect the left side and I want to track it. So you can actually track these. So I will do, oops, it's my, fav my favorite mistake to make is not making a new node first. I'm sure it will be yours for a bit too. New node, number two, and I'm going to grab my gradient. I got my highlight on, so I'm seeing what I'm doing. And yeah, you know, just, let's do it to here. Let's do that. Okay, great. So I picked kind of a weird spot and I'm in the middle of the clip right here. If I move the clip, uh oh, you know, it's going to start to lose it. So I'm going to start at the beginning. Kind of reset this. Get the direction correct. Bring it in. All right, turn my magic wand off so I don't need to see the, the alpha area, which is a fancy word for transparency. Okay. And then we are going to basically do some adjustments here. So, okay, what do I want to do to this side? Well, let's just, let's do something crazy. Let's like modify the colors, you know? So let's rebalance it. Let's make it more, let's make it even redder, right? Okay, so what if I just wanted to do this? This is kind of overkill, but, you know, that'll do for now. And let's add some contrast just to show you guys like what's happening here. So this is kind of, again, a little intense, but just to give you an idea, that's the change. Here it is. Select the mask, power window. And now I'm going to go to my tracker right here. This is another control in this little list here, in this little list of icons. So right next to window is tracker. And it's, sta it's, it's default on window, OK? Stabilizer mode is for stabilizing the actual clip, uh, doing more of like a warp stabilizer type thing. And we'll get to that too. But window is what we want because we're going to track the window, which is this selector. And now all I do is I hit play and look at that. Picks it right up, doesn't miss a beat. And this stays tracked right there, right to it. So every this line will maintain, everything to the left of this line here will not be affected, everything to the right will. And that is how you track stuff. Um, you know, again, I could also do could also find my, you know, I could find this clip, right? I could do a track on this. You know, I, I could get in here and I could pen, I could pen select, you know, I could do like a, a pretty crazy, you know, um, let's see here, window pen. You know, if I want to like get in here and like go crazy on these, I could like, you know, this is again, guys, this is overkill, but you might need to do something like this at some point. Um, and just to show you that this works, uh, tracker, track forward, and look at that. It just tracks it right away, boom. Problem is now I have this dead area over here, so I should probably pull that out. And here, down here is your tracking data, so you can see kind of like, you know, what you've done. And it looks like it's not moving to the left of that spot, so that's where I had it when I tracked, track forward, and then I'm gonna track back, uh, track reverse, and give me the rest of the shot. Now I've got my whole info here, thing stays on. So again, the tracker in DaVinci is super powerful, very amazing, um, very useful for moving windows and tracking those. If you wanna stabilize a shot real quick, I know we're going pretty quick here, but if you wanna stabilize, you know, you can go, um, I would do it on the, the primary node. I would do it on the balance node because, you know, then you just kind of save yourself the work after that and you don't forget to do it. So. I would stabilize right when I do my balance. So like this has a little bit of a shift to it, you know, a little bit of a 
kind of movement. This might not be the best one to do for stabilization. I wonder if this is better. The shots are all pretty stable, but let's just say I want to stabilize this drone clip. There's a little hiccup in the beginning here. Now I'm on the tracker tool, right? And instead of window, I'm gonna choose stabilizer. Don't do FX because that's not for this. So stabilizer, back on the front of the clip. Doesn't really matter where you are for this because there's just one button. There's no forward or back. It just reads the whole clip, but we'll hit stabilize. It will think and it will do it. And there we are, nice and smooth. There's a little bit of a hiccup that's taken away there. And we did, yes, we did lose some, uh, we lost some real estate due to the crop needed to pull off the stabilization, but that's okay. Cause you know, shooting in 4K, wide angle lens, no problem. Okay, so I'm just checking my notes here, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. All right, so that's, that's windowing and tracking. Um, so that's like, again, one way to select everything. You can do it spatially and just straight up make a mask and say, hey, everything inside of this mask or outside of this mask, do this thing too, right? Again, I can just be on this bag and say, crank up the saturation on the bag and it won't affect anything else. Boom. Okay, now the second way to do secondaries, right? So like the other way to select a part of the image, clip some nodes off is to use what's called a qualifier. And this is where it gets real fun. So I will make another node. Um, I will remove my, it's actually quicker just to delete this and make a new one, Alt S, new node. And I'm not gonna use windows. I am going to select all the leaves. Now, oh my God, if you want to select all these leaves or like just the grapes or something, that is so much math. Like, how would you ever get in here and mask all that, right? There's just, there's no way to do it. And it's a handheld shot and it's moving and like chaos. That's not great. So what you wanna do is use uh, qualifiers and qualifiers are right here on this color picker, okay? This is the last big tool thing we're probably gonna learn in this session. So qualifier is not selecting by a region, a spatial region. It's gonna select based on hue, saturation, and luminance. So if I take the picker and I just pick some green here, now look at that. It's saying, okay, here's the green. Uh, it's green of low saturation and moderate luminance, okay? To check what I got, I can turn the wand on. Now, that's not very flattering, right? There's not a lot to go on there. So we need to expand this. We need to actually say, hey, width, more green, we need more green. Okay, we don't want the blue, like the grapes start to come in there. So we don't want that. And right away, I'm gonna denoise this. If we just denoise it a little bit, we'll get softer edges. And immediately we're starting to see the greens come back. Problem is now we're kind of getting this edge. So, you know, I wanna work with um, this clean black control and that will take the edge out a little bit. So there's that, clean white. Usually don't have to clean white too much. Um, and a blur, a blur will help you kind of, you know, um, get that nice finesse, that softness. Spend the time uh, finessing this. <laughs> it's called matte finesse, literally. So finesse your matte, get that all set up and then make your color changes, right? Make sure your selection region is great. We got this weird, these edges happening here, these outlines. So that's in and out ratio. You can just take that in, clean that right out. Now we've got just leaves. Right, that's just the leaves. And there's more, there's more green there than, you know, than we got, but, you know, so we could take this over and we could make this, you know, but I'm starting to get skin tone and that's not great. I wanna, I wanna keep it on the green. So again, I'm moving this around. You can see what I'm getting. This qualifier thing is what makes DaVinci so powerful in isolating stuff. So um, I can also turn saturation on and off. This is saying like, Hey, you know what? Don't even use saturation to determine what, what gets it here. Cause you know, so flip these on and off, you know, like no saturation gets me more green. That's great. It's not always going to be a quick fix, but it can help you. And now luminance, same thing, turning it on and off. Wow. When I don't luminance limit, it is actually getting me quite a bit more and I'm liking that. So again, here's the selection area I'm working with. Once I'm happy with it, turn off my highlight and make sure I'm on the node with the selector, with the, with the qualifier, right? 
you know, the qualifier is basically just keying. It's like chroma keying, guys. And you know, so anytime you're picking a color, you're just keying that color in. You're not keying it out like a green screen. You're saying, keep all this, throw everything else out. So great. Okay, qualifier here. I've got this green. It set me up on this level here with this green. So then again, what do I do once I have all this complicated selection done? Well, I'm just going to go right back to my basic, basic, basic controls, and I'm going to change primaries, which is, again, what I'm working in most of the time. You know, yes, you're selecting stuff. Yes, you're segmenting by color and by space and whatever. But honestly, then what I'm doing to those areas is just mostly primaries. I'm coming back here a lot. You know, I could do curves on it and stuff, but it's okay. Again, just the leaves. Now look at this. This is crazy. Just the leaves. I don't want to do anything drastic. I do want to saturate them more. Probably not like that, but you know. And then I can also, like, you know, warm the leaves up or cool them down. So you start to get into pretty, pretty complex territory when you start messing with um, selection areas like this, right? So that's like, okay, cool. Lift down, gamma. And it's mainly a taste thing. It's like what you want to see. So. You know, I could I would desaturate all the way. It's kind of like, why would I do that? But taking them down in saturation emphasizes her because we're not looking at the leaves as much. So just because you're selecting something does not mean you're going to punch it up and make it better looking or crazier or more colorful. Sometimes you're selecting something to kind of take it down or take it away. And that's great. That's totally fine because then it lets you, you know, it leaves the other stuff to shine. So less is more taking away can sometimes help emphasize what's left. Um, okay, so doing that. And then again, if I do my hue, you know, be careful. <laughs> like I've completely recolored the scene now and I don't know what plant she's picking because this is pretty weird, but you know, I could push it a little bit toward the red hue, like I said before, for more of a filmic look or I could pull it this way, but I'll push it up a tiny bit. Hey, Jesse, we have another question. Um, so uh, Bono asks, uh, node fu node fu nodes function similar to adjustment layers in Premiere, yeah? Any differences? Any difference? Yeah, so nodes will work like adjustment layers where you stack them. <clears throat> you know, this will be processed after this is processed. The exception is when you start to get into what are called layer nodes. Um, so those will not process in a certain order. Those are actually being processed at the same time and then mixed together. Um, so that does have an advantage over um, a linear color correction process. And I'm, again, I'm not going to go to that a ton today because it gets pretty complex, but essentially, you know, you can add other types of nodes. I've been showing you guys adding serial nodes, but um, parallel and layers are really um, Layer. Yeah, so like this, right? So now what I'm doing is I'm breaking the image up into three parts. And what I'm saying is this balanced image is going to feed all three of these, okay? So all three of these are going to happen at the same time, kind of like simultaneously in a weird way. And then they're going to mix out to the output. So you see that the one I worked on has got the green selection. Okay, now what if I do, now let's do another one. Let's go purple, right? Boom, let's pull the purple. Let's do noise. Let's take the width out. Saturation doesn't do much. Luminance doesn't do much. A little bit in and out ratio. Okay, so the purple, right? I got the purple there. Take that off. So now I'm gonna change. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna only do two here. Um, and these are gonna add on each other. I know this is a little, little quick on this, guys. You can Google this, but when you do layer nodes, the top one is on the bottom. I know it's really weird, but this is gonna be on top of this. You can see that it's processing it on top of what's happening here. So it is kind of a hybrid of something happen happening simultaneously and happening in a certain order, but it's kind of the way that DaVinci mixes stuff. So this first, then these two at the same time, then they mix and then go to output. So here's the purple, you know, I've done purple, make it a little more red, change the hue, and okay, we're going to there, a little like, now I've totally modified that, right? And now I could go one more, you know, I could even go over here then and make another serial and then do another contrast pass in the whole thing and say like, okay, cool, you know, here's like, here's my final look. 
and like, wow, that is a look that's very, very different than what we started with, right? There's that and there's that. And even if I turn this last bit off, you know, you can see that like each of these changes I made, like that's pretty drastic, that's pretty drastic and you can trace your way back. But in effect, if you're not using layers, if you're just doing, you know, single serial nodes, then yes, it's basically like stacking adjustment layers, um, except it's a lot more CPU friendly. So hope that answers the, uh, the question. Okay, so secondary is looking at 40 minutes left here. Okay, so we talked about um, spatial selection and we've talked about window selection. And then one last thing that we're gonna do is just kind of modifying colors um, through our other curves. So I showed you regular curves here. Um, I'm gonna make another node here. Just, this is like a blank one, another one that's feeding this thin. And now I'm gonna just do some color mixing, okay? So this is like kind of the last way. I know I said there was two ways, but there, this is really the last thing that you're gonna do for secondary stuff. And this is really what else also helps you build a look, makes it unique. And that is, you know, you got curves here, but there's all these extra curves. Okay, guys, this is huge. This is like such secret sauce in DaVinci. Hue versus hue literally will change a color. So, if I pick a color, it'll give me a spot. It's gonna say, yes, this is the color. And then if I move it up or down, look at what's happening on the vector scope. I'm rotating the hue for that, for that one color, okay? So this is another way of selecting, okay? So you don't have to just do it spatially or say just these colors, but this again, this is acting on the entire image, even though it's just your jacket, it's saying all purples are gonna get moved, you know? this would be like all greens are gonna get moved, but there's some problems because things can break. So be careful, you know, right? So like there's a lot of yellow and like, you know, so I can start color mixing here. Hue versus hue is going to modify what colors are what, okay? You're changing colors with hue versus hue. This is a gradation of the rainbow um, left to right and top to bottom. So if I just grab one thing here, this is literally just doing the same as a hue rotation which was back here on, on this, right? It's the same exact control. So I hope that's not too mystifying. The next one over, next dot. And again, remember these are in the menu here. Third dot over, hue versus saturation. This is kind of the one I'm, I'm leaning on most guys. This one is like really, really great because you're, this lets you color mix, okay? So the color histogram behind this will show you that, okay, there's a lot of yellow. There's some purple, a little bit of teal. I'm gonna bring this all the way down, which would give us a black and white image. This is saying, I want zero of all the colors, right? So now I'm gonna bring up just a couple things. I'm gonna bring up just the purple. There's the jacket, right? Okay. And then I, there's a lot here, so I, I can't ignore that. I'm gonna keep this pinned down, but I'm gonna bring that up. Now we got the green. And I'm, this is, again, guys, this is saturation. This is how much saturation you're getting. Now we're gonna start to, we're losing some stuff, right? Remember I said, be careful about breaking footage. We are breaking footage here. You wanna be careful. Um, so that probably is this extra green stuff here. Yep, there it is. See that came, coming back because there's some here. There's not as little as the red, which there's, which there's none of, there's some. So if you take something away, you better be prepared to you know, soften it up, deal with the consequences. So again, this is like super saturating just the green and teal or pulling it down. This is a color mixer, kind of like in Lightroom. So take the red down, taking the red down takes out our skin tone. I don't want that. So I'm gonna bring that up actually and keep this down here. And that's pretty cool. That's a nice little color mix. And that is a look, right? It adds a little bit of a look, nice and bright. Next one over, hue versus luminance. So this is tricky. This is like, you know, if I grab the whole thing and just bring it up and down, we're gonna work with um, all brightness of everything, right? But what I wanna do is, is individually pick brightness for a certain hue. So I could just pick green. And again, I'm just changing the brightness of the green. 
this, this, all the curves here are ways for you to isolate colors and say, do this to all the, this color. So that's Heber's luminance. Luma versus saturation. Okay, so now this one is a map of, it's a histogram of um, how much color is in the darks, middles, and highlights. So we're seeing that there's no color in the shadows, a lot in the low mids, a little in the upper mids, but not really much in the highlights, which is funny because it looks really highlighty. But again, we're actually not, most of this is kind of under here and not really hitting a lot. There's a little of this clipping. Yeah, it's happening over here on the right side, but you know, not too bad. So, so how do I use this? Okay, well, what I do is I make a point. Now I could say, take down the saturation of all the shadows, right? What would that do? So you can see, and look at that. That's pretty dramatic. This is a very, very common film look, guys. This is a great way to build a film look because you can, you know, typically with film stocks, as you, as you under, as you underexpose and as they get closer to shadows, the color information doesn't stick as well. Doesn't really record color as much. So digital is not that way. Digital is like, yeah, shadows have all the color. Great. Well, you know what? That can be kind of a, a loud uh, look sometimes, you know, you don't really want that all the time. Like that's crazy. So taking out the color out of the shadows, like look at all that color I removed. We're still getting a lot of good info here. I might bring this back up. And you can do the same thing with the highlights. So I could pick a spot, take the highlights down. And now I'm saying, make the highlights black and white. And look at that, they are, right? I've taken all the color out of the highlights and that's not correct. So we need to be careful. Or I can put more color in, see that? Now the highlights have lots of color. So this is like how you mix, you know, you, you use all these to kind of mix the, what the color is gonna be, how much of it do you want, what value is it, you know, do the brights get some, do the darks get some, do the mids get some, how's that looking? Saturation versus saturation. This is the same as the color boost control. I'm not gonna touch that. You can Google that later. And then saturation versus luminance, again, um, a little bit of a, a weird one to mess with, but you can just mess with it and get the hang of it. But you know, every time you see these two words, you know, hue versus hue or luma versus satch, that's what you're putting on the graph. That's what's on the X and Y axes here. The, really the way to learn this is just to get in here and go whole hog and just start messing around because you'll start to see pretty quickly what happens. But the main ones I'm sticking in are of course the regular curves here, which is just no frills, you know, regular old curves control. Hue versus hue to modify colors. Hue versus satch to change how much of each color I have, turning them up or down. And then the brightness, right? So hue, saturation, and luminance for all these different colors. Um, that's what these secondary curve controls give you, which again, can really help when you, uh, when you wanna build a look. So any questions on secondary curve controls here. Cool, all right. So let's say that you've uh, you built a look, you know, and you've done it like, you've done this kind of look here. Like this is, this is a balanced thing. And then we're gonna add this note here and make our look. Okay, this is our, our look or, you know, the style that we're, we've graded this already, it's done. So now what I can do is I can actually make a LUT out of this. And a LUT is, uh, you might be familiar, but it's a lookup table. And a LUT is basically like a color transform preset. So a LUT could be used, you know, for anything. It could be used to stylize footage. It could be used to, you know, you could monitor your footage on set on your monitor with a look. So you can already see it kind of modified. Uh, but mainly you're just gonna want to build, build LUTs um, so that editors can use them on the flat footage, right? It's tough to edit this <laughs> with any feeling. So if you give people this to edit with, okay, great. You know, you're already giving them part, part of the way there and that's a lot better. So unfortunately you can only export a lot from a single node. So what I'd wanna do is like take these settings and put them here and also do all that color stuff. But let's say I just wanna do this, this last little transform that, that look right there and then apply that to other, other footage. So I can click the node and right click and say LUT. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm forgetting this, guys. Hold on a second. Not selected. There's a way to do this. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, you know what? I remember. I think I remember this. Okay, so this is also really useful. If you want to actually save stills over here, um, what you can do is right click and say grab still. And then if you click the gallery, you've got, look at this, I've got this right here. I just made that. So once you've made something, it's gonna take whatever node you used and, and kind of store that here. So this is like not only like a PNG and a JPEG, but it's also a look, a look file. It's kind of a dynamic frame with lots of metadata. So I can right click and I can say export with display LUT. And then it will ask me, where do I want to put it? I'll say, okay, desktop, you know, and, you know, the main file is an image file. Okay, you know, JPEG, PNG, whatever, BMP. You hit export and it will make you the LUT, which is a .cube file. And then what you can do is you can go, you know, back to another clip and you can say, okay, actually I want to, I want to load up another LUT, you know, so I think you can do that here. It's selected. Oh yeah, okay, so it's in LUTs and then you basically, you know, navigate through here and, and pull it in that way. We're not gonna cover LUTs a lot today because it's, again, that's a whole nother rabbit hole guys. So sorry about that, but um, that's how you can kind of build, you know, build a look and then export it and then reuse that or hand it off to an editor. And a LUT can be used in Premiere or Avid or Final Cut or DaVinci. And you know, not all LUTs are used to add style. Sometimes they can be used just to give you this basic balance, right? So like some LUTs are already already come pre-made. Like if I made, um, I've got this, you know, turn that off. If I load up a LUT, this was shot in Sony S-Log3. So I'll right click and say LUT. And I'm gonna find a LUT that's not meant to stylize. It's just meant to bring this into regular contrast look, which we call Rec 709. Rec 709 just means like normal contrast, normal color, whites are white, blacks are black, color looks normal, nothing's out of balance. And so I'll go to here, I'll go to Sony S log three to Rec 709. Now that's a look, that's a LUT look. But the look is just to transform it back to real life. Okay, now look at the LUT. What what happened here? Why did this break? Well, a number of reasons. You know, LUTs are built for footage that's shot in a pretty normal exposure. This was probably, you know, slightly overexposed and so it's gonna do weird stuff. You can work with that LUT and then, you know, come over here and then say, okay, actually we're gonna take that game down. But, you know, the LUT gets you from here to here and already that's a, that's a big improvement, you know? So you could just, you could do a whole project where you just slam a LUT on everything and then make a note after it and, you know, and adjust from there. Um, you can also do these, LUT adjustments directly on the LUT node, which will happen after the LUT. So that is sort of a quick and dirty rendition of, you know, what are LUTs, what are they used for, why do they matter? Um, so that's that. Okay, and you know, it got me pretty close. You know, I mean, I could shut that off and turn on my other one. Mine is different looking, right? It's stylized, I did some stuff to it. It's not the same thing. So LUTs are not like a cure-all. For, for footage, but you can use them as kind of a basis to get you into the normal range. And you can use them as a, as a stylization tool. So, and, you know, just to be, just to show you that really quick, um, I can, I loaded up this LUT here, which is the normal transform that gets us into regular color out of log. And then I'm gonna load up another LUT on this one. I think there's one called film looks. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so now I'm gonna emulate, this is called a FPE, film print emulation. So I'm gonna add Kodak 2383 look. And wow, that sure messed stuff up, didn't it? But you know, now what if I like, I can, I can mess with this, great, okay, cool. So you can see already that like, you know, this did, this did quite a bit, right? The, the look 
that's like normal. And there's the look, and it does look more filmic. You know, Kod that Kodak film print emulation is a specific film stock. So they're trying to emulate what film looks like. And it does look pretty filmy. It's kind of nice, you know? So I, I could use that if I wanted to, and I could apply it to every clip um, or not. So another thing too, is if you want to copy individual nodes, like if I just had this style that I just used and went LUT and back to film and we'll do Kodak. Well, I probably don't want to stack them like that, but you know, you, this is just to show you guys, can, you can stack LUTs and you can go, you can go as crazy as you want and kind of just go down the, the line here with them. So I only use LUTs when I'm kind of just like creating quick ex exports or, you know, quick and dirty stuff for people. If I've got the time, I am going to go in here and I'm going to create my own look kind of like this. So that is LUTs. Let me check my notes here. So... Yeah, just a quick time check. We have around 25 minutes left, Jesse. So just keep that in mind. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Well, we are doing good. We're on track to actually finish everything, which is uh, super crazy. <laughs> so yeah, guys, thanks thanks again for sticking around. Uh, I know it's a pretty marathon session, pretty dense. Uh, hopefully the replay lets you kind of unpack some of this stuff. And I will give you guys my contact info at the end. In case you have any more questions, um, you can DM me or email me get in touch and help you sort out your questions because definitely want you guys to walk away with a, a solid understanding. So, and you know, this is a, a pretty brief overview today, but the program goes really deep. There's all these other sections. There's a whole editing thing. There's the special effects and the audio, you know, this is just the color panel. It's like a, a fifth of the program. So just to get your toes wet. Okay, so we talked about grading. We talked about nodes, talked about curves talked about skin tones. Now I wanna kind of move into the final phase of, of grading, which to me is finishing. We just did a film print emulation and like loaded up looks and use a LUT for that. Um, so other things that you wanna think about after you've finished grading, you know, there's a couple extra steps that you might wanna take, right? So other stuff you might wanna do, I'm just gonna give you guys some ideas, okay? These are the things that kind of make a film sort of like, it's like that last little, that little spice that makes it look unique, that really defines the visual, visual characteristic of the film or the piece. So let me delete that. Now, if I zoom in here, I can see that like, okay, it's, it's pretty sharp, you know, it's, it's pretty good, but often a step people like to take is to do a little bit of sharpening at the end, right? So for sharpening, I've got my extra node that's just for sharpening. That way I can turn it on and off and I can see if I like it without having to turn this all off. <laughs> Second node here, Alt S, make a node. And then I'm going over to the last tool we're gonna, we're gonna look at today, which is blur and sharpen. So that's this. So blur and sharpen are the same. Don't be confused. It adds, adds a little control on sharpen, but don't, don't be confused there. Just go to sharpen. And I'll tell you guys the setting right now. It's, it's all about radius, okay? So if you, if you set that too low, like, whoa, that's gonna be really weird. I like 0.47. I think that's perfect. As soon as you start to go, as soon as you start to go beyond 0.47, it starts to get real chunky and, and you know, look, look, I'm bringing in grain here, or, or sorry, noise, and that's not a great look. So, you know, just enough to give it like some sharpness. And when you zoom out, you probably can't see over the Zoom call, but it just gives us a little flavor of like, yeah, this is nice and crisp and tack sharp. It's like the final sharpening you'd do on any image, you know, if you exported it for like Instagram or social media or something. So sharpen, that's how you do it right over here at the blur and sharpen tool. I just do the radius 0.47 or 0.46, never going below 0.45 because that's just overkill. Um, and you will start to see it look pretty strange at that point. So sharpening is one. Um, another thing that you can do is, as far as finishing goes is a vignette, okay? So I'll make another node here. And a vignette is, there's no, I mean, you know, you could drag in an effect because DaVinci has effects here, right? That's pretty great. We're not covering that today. 
but you could build a vignette on your own. And so what I'll do for a vignette is I'll go to my mask or my window tool, right? I want a circular vignette. I will shrink or I will expand this. I will give it a pretty big feather. I'm gonna stick to this horizontal kind of format, bring it out. And I wanna darken the edges, right? So I wanna darken, <clears throat> again, primaries. It's got everything you need. You might go to curves, but like that's overkill. You can just do it all in primaries. Gain down. Now wait, whoa, 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 what's happening? The middle is going down. I want the outside to go down. So all we do, remember this is our mask area. All we do is go in here and flip it. And now we're only selecting the outer area. See that? And then I'm bringing that down. So turn off my splines and look at that nice vignette. Right? Just kind of helps the eye focus in a little more. I will say that after you make a correction on a node, you can turn it down. You can turn down that specific node if you want. Like if that vignette's too hot or, you know, it's, it's going too crazy. Um, you know, yeah, you, you, you could get in here and, and go back and, you know, and be like, oh, okay, let's bring it out, you know. But if you want that, this shape and you just kind of want to not have it be so intense, like, yeah, you can back off the, the gain or whatever, but you can also go dramatic. Then go to, oops, let's see here. Eh, where is it? Yeah, okay, it's this one's key right here. It's right next to blur, so key. And you can again see the keying of what you're doing. This is the mask key. And you can take the gain down. Look at that, very soft. So we're just saying, turn this node down, turn up, turn down whatever you're doing there. You know, you can turn it up also, but that's not great. So we wanna go back and set it to like 0 0.8, a little less. And it just adds that last little bit of something. Okay. Now I mentioned the um, denoising. That's a big part of the studio version of, of Resolve. So I will show you that here before we're out of time. And that is done here in the motion effects tool. That's like the one, two, sixth one over right here. It shows like the blur and the little landscape. So noise reduction, this is tricky. You know, usually people, what you wanna do is you wanna do all your grading and then do any stabilization or lens distortion correction, um, any film print emulation, you know, get your colors like totally dialed in and then you want to denoise after you've done color. And I know a lot of people debate this. So if you go online, there's people that will argue this until like, you know, <laughs> forever. Um, but a lot of people say, you know, oh, you should denoise, you should denoise uh, first before you do any color. Well, the problem with that is if you denoise first and then you color correct, you're actually kind of bringing back a lot of that noise because you're re recontrasting and reemphasizing whatever you've done before. So. I like to go full grade, get it done. Here's my sharpen, here's my vignette. Look at the order here. And I'm gonna actually go back here and put one in between, Alt S from the first node. And right before my sharpen, I'm gonna denoise. Because look, we're getting noise, right? So I'm gonna choose five frames better with a large range and that's saying use the max number of frames to detect the noise, do the better way and use a large area. Kind of kind of weird there because, you know, usually you expect like large, you'd probably want it like, oh, I want the noise to be small, but no, no, you actually want this all to be maxed out if you can, if you can afford it on your computer, better and large. At that point, you crank this up, start going. And you can turn off the sharpen just to give you a little bit of a help there to see what's up. Now they're linked together, luminance and chrominance. So luma is the actual, the, the, the brightness speckling that you see that gives grain its, its kind of feel. If I turn that to zero, you can see it's a lot more spotty. And chroma is the actual like color noise, right? So you don't always wanna do these together. I like to do more chroma reduction usually than luma. That's that's what's called temporal noise reduction. And then there's spatial. This is like two different denoisers, pretty intense. <laughs> and again, you wanna go max, right? Spatial, you wanna go mode, enhanced, radius, large, and then bring this up again.
you know, and we're starting to do the same thing, starting to lose the color a little bit. Um, so now if I turn this off, again, we have it on its own node, so I can turn it off. We can see that it brought back the noise and that that nukes it when I turn it back on. So that's pretty good, right? There's, there's a few more things I might do to that, but you know, for now, that's great. Just don't be surprised if your CPU bogs down or you cannot play this back. Cause like now if I try to play back, it's going just crawling. It's just crazy slow, right? That's fine though, whatever. All right, cause again, color grading, you're just kind of looking at stills. So I've done my color correction, do, 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 got that whole thing, great. Now I've denoised the footage and it is looking nice. And because you're denoising, you are losing sharpness. So then I am adding the sharpness back, which gives me the crispy, crispy on the grapes. Good, nice and juicy there. And then the last thing is the vignette, which I've overlaid um, and kind of just place that on top. You know, so at this point you could also add, you know, you go in here and add film grain, you know, or do other stuff on top of that. The very last step is to bake that on top. You don't wanna do things in the wrong order because you could be increasing your noise or, you know, messing up your picture in other ways. So um, that is sort of looks and finishing and last steps. Let me just make sure I'm not missing any other stuff here. Okay, cool. So at this point, uh, we can go to export and delivery. So this edit is not done, you know, like I haven't done all the, that juice to like everything, but just, you know, so this one had some masking, this one had some stabilization. Like I've used these different clips to kind of show different parts of the program. That's pretty intense now that I look at it actually. So I might have to back that off. And again, to back it off, color, go here, key, turn down. And now I'm not like going quite so overkill. Yeah, that's better, great. So I'm not trying to get this perfect today. I just wanna show you guys. So, you know, again, you go back to your old work and you're like, whoa, that's intense. Again, no shame in turning it down. Um, I encourage you all to take, um, take breaks. So like give your eyes a rest every 20 to 30 minutes. And I either just like, like to go outside or I know it's not very exciting, but you can stare at a blank wall. You can stare at a white or a gray wall and that will actually reset your rods and cones in your eye. And when you look back at the screen, you'll kind of have a different, cleaner perspective, a more objective view on what you're doing. So simple stuff, but really effective. You know, again, here I'm looking back at this and going, whoa, that's an overkill, but you can always back stuff off, you know, and um, it's really useful to, to kind of take a break and, and come back and check. So, uh, so we are going to export this non-perfect timeline that has been sort of color graded. And last quick thing, really quick before we do that is, I know I wasn't going to teach any editing guys, but you know, you can go on the front here and pick this. Um, and I'm in the, I'm in the edit graph here, or the edit screen here choose the beginning, you know, select kind of the edge, right? It lights up red. And uh, what I can do is take this little uh, nugget here and pull this over. And that's an automatic fade. That'll just give you a fade. You don't have to drag a uh, cross dissolve on or anything like that. You know, you could go to effects library, video transitions, cross dissolve, drag it on. You know, you could do that too. But honestly, you're probably just gonna wanna you know, just give yourself a nice, easy built-in fade. It's just a nice feature that it has so that, you know, fades in. That's the tip. And on the tail, I'll do the same thing. That's a little quick, or I need that to be longer, shorter. And the commercial's done, great. 30 second wine commercial. Okay, great. So this is done. Now I'm gonna go to deliver, right? So I've gone edit done color, maybe I've done my audio, and I go deliver. Okay, so we're back at the delivery screen. I mentioned this at the very beginning of the workshop today, and here we are. So pretty easy, guys. I mean, there are some presets here, you know, if you wanna just click, click through. So there's different ways to do this. You know, you could export the whole thing as individual clips. 
I could actually click individual clips here and then bake these all out, shove them back into Premiere, you know, lay titles on top or do something since all the clips would be corrected at that point. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a single clip, which means that I'm like finishing this in Resolve. So I'll call it wine commercial export one. I will just choose desktop because it's super easy. Location is good there. Uh, again, rendering single clip, which means like one finished piece. I have checked export video. I have checked export audio. Um, so that's all good. And then again, you know, I'm just gonna, these are settings that you probably know how to export with, but you know, um, video, I'm gonna choose uh, QuickTime H.264. This is pretty standard for web. You know, I'm gonna use the NVIDIA encoder since it's a little bit better and quicker. Resolution will be this. Um, again, if you wanna change the final, like if I wanted to output it 4K, I would go back to my project settings and say, oh yeah, actually, you know what? We're gonna bump this up to Ultra HD. And at that last step, then you would get your 4K out. And it keeps all your settings, all your framing, all your scaling, stabilization, cropping, denoising. It just uh, upreses it, or you know, it keeps the keeps the quality there. So you don't need to worry about doing it all in 4K until the very end. Quality, automatic best. Uh, that's pretty crazy. It's pretty high. It's like 100 megabits. I'm gonna go medium. PBR. That's fine. I don't need to mess with all this. This is crazy stuff. Just basically checking like, all right, automatic quality here, H.264, my audio is turned on. And then file is like, you know, do you want to use timeline name or the custom name and all that stuff? If you choose individual clips, you got more options here. So then it would say, do you want to make each of these clips a unique file name? Do you want to add the source frame count? Do you want, you know, what do you want to do here to, to make all those files have their own unique names so they don't get confusing? But we're just doing single. There we are. And my file name has been destroyed. So wine commercial export one. When I've got my settings, I add the render queue. This is just like media encoder or um, compressor back in the day with Final Cut 7. So here it is, I select it. And I make sure as a last step, I make sure my handles are good, right? So if I have extra clips out here, I don't want those. So make sure your handles are okay. You can also hit I and O for in and out. So I'll hit I and O, we're all good. Default, it'll just have it set to all the clips. And then render. It's going at 113 frames a second, 37. This one's heavy duty. We had a lot of nodes, remember? This one had a lot of denoising. It's going slowly and it should resume. Yeah, five frames a second. So like denoising adds a ton of, of work for the CPU, but that was a 30 second piece. It came out in about 10 seconds just now. So that's pretty sweet. And now we got this file on the desktop, which I will see if I can load. And here's the footage set. Here are the clips I used, guys. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm about to drop that in the... Uh, chat for us in a minute here. Let me grab that location. Desktop, wine commercial export one. Apologies if this is really loud. I'm not sure how the volume is set. Same volume, cool. And there it is. It is, it is literally exactly what we made. Exported everything. And there we are with the fade out and all. So. That is how you get through a workflow in DaVinci. That is how you finish something and export it. Um, I am gonna take this moment to drop this link in the chat box. And that's a Dropbox link. So hopefully you can just grab all those. Um, it's got all the clips in here and a few more, I believe. So again, some were shot on the Mavic. Um, some were shot on the a7 III on the Sony. And I intentionally used, you know, um, less than amazing, you know, I mean, like those cameras are great, but we could have used red footage or something. But, you know, learning on footage that was shot on like cameras that are not like top of the top of line camera will teach you more, you know, you'll be able to like match footage and learn the limitations better so that when you get your hands on some better footage, like raw footage, 
then you can really flex stuff and it won't break as easily. Then you'll have more kind of discipline and control um, on that. So with that, um, just to kind of review again, everything, um, I guess I'll, I'll just name these off really quick too. So I would, um, you know, after this class, feel free to download that footage set, drag it all into DaVinci. Um, you're not gonna have that big ProRes cut up to do, you'll just have individual clips. So you kind of have to like sort through those, but you could just grade and not edit too. Um, another fun thing to try guys is to, you know, we looked at scopes today, but don't just look at scopes on your stuff, you know, pull a still from, a film, like a, just take a screenshot off of Netflix, you know, pick your favorite movie or show or something and, and think about what it is, you know, if it's reality TV or if it's a narrative feature film and look at the scopes and try to determine what's kind of going on, you know, think about what's bright, what's dark. And, and oftentimes you'll be surprised at the fact that you're not using the full scale. You're not even dipping into the, the bright, bright, bright whites or the deep blacks at all. You're kind of just building stuff in that middle range where it's really calibrated and it's not gonna like go out of weird brightness if you play it on a weird device. So reading video scopes on a still from your favorite film, also a painting. Just if you love looking at color and style, pull a still of a painting, throw that as a JPEG into Resolve and look at those scopes. That can also tell you a lot about color selection, um, palette and kind of what's going on. You know, a lot of cinematographers love to lean on paintings for uh, inspiration. And then of course, last thing is, you know, this is recorded. So if you need to reference it at any time, uh, Brandon will post that and give you guys the link um, so you can watch the replay there. So um, I guess, yeah, this is the moment for any last questions.